Okay, and I'm Jeff Spieler. I will be giving this uh, training course. And uh, everybody, I'm sorry for those on the phone. Uh, everything that we have is actually available electronically, but I was not aware that we would, uh, we, we would need that. So you can get all of the materials. Almost everything's available electronically. That which isn't, there's plenty of copies, and uh, we, you can get them. We'll bring them back to Crystal City or the RRB, depending on where you are. Uh, so uh, I guess this is about the third. Is the sound check working all right? Yes. OK. So um, I th we're going to be taped today. Yes. Uh, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure why. But I sort of wish the last one was because it was such a good success and I had such good jokes <laughs> that everybody really enjoyed themselves. But I got to see if I can remember those jokes that I put into the technology. So let me begin by introducing myself. Uh, I have worked in the Office of Population and Reproductive Health since 1983. Um, one of the few people that spent their entire aid career in the same division in the same office, although we changed our names many times since 1983. And prior to that, I spent 11 years in the human reproduction program at WHO, working on contraceptive technology. And prior to that, I was in a pharmaceutical company. And for five years, in my last three years, I was in the contraceptive research and development program at Literally Laboratories. So I've spent my whole life uh, working on what I have the most passion about and still do. And on December 12th, I am retiring. That's uh, why we're videotaping you. Although <laughs> I'm not going cold turkey, I'll still do a little bit of consulting at least next year on a very part-time, minimal basis. Um, so I really love to talk about contraceptive technology, and I hope you all do too. And you should all have a packet in front of you. And we're going to go in the order, hopefully, that that packet has been organized. Um, and it begins with the... Um, with the agenda to give you an idea of what we're going to talk about. We have until 4 o'clock and depending, I hope we can get through everything on this program and maybe Kara can keep me on track to make sure that we do. Uh, I would suggest that you uh, ask any questions at any time that you want. And what we're going to, what, what I want to begin with actually uh, uh, are three sort of handouts that I think everybody should have amongst the many other things you all should have. Um, and I don't know what order you have them in. So behind, after your agenda, what's the first document? The paper. OK. So here is a paper that um, Roy Jacobstein, Carolyn Curtis, myself, and Scott wrote for a FIGO presentation. And this, this is one of the few papers that has, in my view, ever been written that sort of not just do, doesn't just cover unmet need, but covers a lot of things related to unmet need. So if you haven't seen this paper at your leisure, uh, uh, read it. The next document is um, the elements of successful family planning programs. How many people have seen this already? Okay. So this was the result of uh, a survey of more than 700 people that uh, JHUCCP did and is, and is published as a POP report. Uh, and all I've done is listed down the, um, these 10 elements of a successful family planning program. And we had people in the field identify what they think were the most important components of family planning programs. And I've used this slide many times. And depending on who I'm talking to, I highlight certain things. For instance, when I talk to the when I go to JSI and give a talk, I highlight contraceptive supply logistics systems. Mm -hmm. Because that's, where, that's one of the main things that they, that they uh, contribute towards. And the, so it's, these are good things to have. And I would suggest that if you haven't read the uh, POP report on this, uh, the 10 elements of successful family planning programs, you should. Uh, the next item is a very interesting uh, thing that Roy Jacobstein and I did. And at the last time I made this presentation, somebody said, why don't you have SDM on this? Because we're going to talk about SDM. So... Uh, I was not clever enough to figure out how to take this slide that was in a PDF and add SDM, so I wrote it by hand. <laughs> so the importance of this uh, is just to remind everybody about uh, people use contraception because they want to prevent an unintended pregnancy. And some methods are more effective in doing that than other methods. And this 
table sort of puts out in, uh, uh, in order of uh, most effective to uh, least effective to most effective methods and its typical use. And if a thousand people use this method for a year, how many pregnancies would occur? And we have 850 if you use nothing. It's somewhere between 800 and 850. Uh, and then you can relate each of the following methods by how do they relate to 850. And um, I added SDM in there, which falls between the male condom and the pill, actually. But really important take-home message I've added, like next to IUDs, they're 11 times more effective than the pill. And implants are 120 times more effective than injectables. <coughs> So it really sets it, um, uh, it sets the stage for understanding effectiveness. And we're going to talk a lot about long-acting reversible contraception. Uh, and that should be made available to all women who want to use it. And just because you have it doesn't necessarily mean people are going to choose it. But if you don't have them in your programs, then there's no possibility of choosing them. So the first, uh, so those are background documents for you to keep. The conference. Okay, so uh, the first method that we're going to talk about are oral contraceptives, right? That's on your list. And you actually have two handouts on oral contraceptives. And why do you have two? Normally you'd only have the one pager that I did. And I try to update these, uh, and they frequently need to be updated. I'm walking with Kara to update them because a lot of the data that I have in there, I, I think everything's cor everything is in, in it is correct. But uh, when I talk about the use of the methods in countries, we need to look at recent DHSs to see what's changed. And the reason that you have two versions of all of the of four methods is because, uh, interesting, I was working with Alana White uh, in SDI and uh, on an issue that came up in the Philippines. So all of you know about the Philippines. You know that they passed the family planning legislation finally after years and years of discussion. Um, it would be very interesting to do the bubble graphs, if any of you have seen Mind Gap, um, and to show what, how the Philippines and Thailand started off at the same place in 1960. In the Philipp Thailand is a, an Asian tiger, a very effective program, and the Philippines has just languished uh, for many reasons, a lot of it due to resistance of the um, Catholic Church to contraception, and this bill has just passed. But the mission needs, the, the, the Ministry of Health wants proof that all of the methods it will provide do not block implantation or cause abortion. Mm -hmm. So what we were working on, what I was working on with Alana and others, is uh, something called Research uh, Literature Contraceptive Mechanism of Action. And that's why you have this document also. And you're going to have it for four methods. Uh, it is not, uh, it's not very... It adds a little more information about the method, but if you want a snapshot of the method, this one pager does it for you. So, um, the agent, so who doesn't know about oral contraceptives? So does everybody know which oral contraceptive USAID buys? It's on my little list. It's called microgynin. It's a combined oral contraception, contraceptive with a progestin, levonorgestrel, and an, ethen, and an estrogen, ethanyl estradiol. And the package looks like this that we sell. It's called microgynin. And we also provide, and I'll pass these around, um, the same product uh, is also sold, has a commercial, the, the uh, social marketing of it is called Combination 3. It's the exact same product, just looks a little bit different, but it's the same combination, but it's labeled for um, social marketing. And the, one of the important things uh, to know about oral contraception uh, is that, and most people don't realize it, it has many other health benefits besides highly effective when used correctly. So oral contraceptives are highly effective, but in actual use they're only about 92% effective because people don't consistently use them. Uh, but the important thing is that, that there's no question with the use of oral contraception 
that there is protection against ovarian and endometrial cancer and functional ovarian cysts and decreased risk for benign breast disease and pelvic inflammatory disease. It causes a block of cervical mucus that prevents uh, ascending infection. Uh, it works primarily by blocking ovulation. It also has another effect which, which uh, the, the uh, progestin in the combined pill causes the cervical mucus to become thick and it reduces sperm penetration through cervical mucus so the sperm don't get to the uterus. It's, that's particularly more with uh, progestin-only methods, but the progestin outweighs the estrogen in the pill in terms of block causing that cervical uh, block. Like uh, all other methods other than male and female condoms, we have to tell everybody there's no protection against HIV and STIs when you use oral contraceptives. Um, they require daily use. Uh, and, um, and on this list, it has a few of the, um, of the potential risks, including potential risk on cardiovascular disease, but it's a very small risk. And the, uh, the absolute risk is very low. And an interesting story to tell you, when I first started working in this field, um, in the UK, oral contraception was the most popular method. It is the most popular method, reversible method in the United States. 21% of, of users in the United States use pills, use OCs. The most um, commonly used in method in, in the United States is male and female sterilization, because those numbers are cumulative. But in terms of reversible, it's, it's oral contraception. And in the UK, when the first study came out that showed there's a potential risk of cardiovascular disease in uh, ECs, particularly in smokers. So you know if you're over 35 and you smoke, the combined pill is not for you. So the family planning program that I worked with, and I worked with Marie Stopes back in those days, believe it or not, some long ago, they were all sure that, well, these women would just stop smoking. No, they stopped using oral contraception because they wanted to smoke. <laughs> so it was sort of the opposite public health message that we were trying to give, but they moved to other contraceptive methods. Uh, and the progestin-only pills are, that we provide are called microlute. Okay, it's the levonorgestrel only. It looks like this. Uh, and uh, the difference between uh, POPs and uh, ECs and OC, combined oral contraceptives primarily has to do with one, when you're on using progestin-only pills, you really need to take them the same time every day. Now we tell women to take, if you're on oral contraceptive, take it the same time every day so you don't forget it. But if you took it in, if you forgot and you took it in the afternoon or when you got home, it wouldn't make any difference. POPs are much more sensitive to the time that you take them. And they're not as effective uh, as combined pills. And they were primarily used for women who were breastfeeding. As a, a, to increase your effectiveness during breastfeeding. Of course, you, we're gonna, we could talk about lactational amenorrhea method. You really don't need anything uh, for the first six months if you're fully breastfeeding and not yet menstruating. You've got over 98% protection against unintended pregnancy. Uh, so any questions about OCs? Pardon? Well, they, they would fall right under the pill. They're, they're not significantly less effective. They're not quite as, and if you're breastfeeding, they're just as effective. But there's a, a little lower rate. There is, an, uh, there is a um, POP on the market that we do not buy. It's called Cerazet. It's made by Merck. It's a, got a, it's a different kind of a drug. We don't buy it. It's much, much more effective. It's as effective as ECs. Uh, sorry, OCs. So staying in the, um, in the field of oral contraception, what is the next oral contraceptive on the list? On the program. Uh, EC. EC, emergency contraception. Emergency contraception is a form of oral contraception. And uh, you have a set of documents, and I put mine aside, and that set of documents, um, I didn't grab my own set of those, uh, I'm sorry, you do have it. You've got the EC briefer. You've got the EC briefer, which I produced. Uh, uh, and you have the, um, what else do you have? I didn't, so you've got, let me just pull up and see. 
Yes. Okay. We have three documents. So we've got an emergency contraception briefer. We've got a document that came out from the International Consortium for Emergency Contraception and FIGO that tells you uh, everything you need to know about emergency contraception. And I also included, um, hot off the press, our colleague Trish McDonald sent out an email. Did anybody see it? And that email was to the field. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm, talking, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. That was in implants. What you have is the email that we sent out to the field on EC when we made the decision that we would begin purchasing emergency contraception. So it's you say technical guidance to the field on emergency contraception. Looks like this document. Okay, so um, what's the most important thing about emergency contraception? Being from GC, I want to know how it's different from a Okay. Because I know we have had that question. I will, over the and we've had briefers to Congress on that. That's right. Okay, so <laughs> it, how does it differ from abortion? What else? What else do we need to know about EC? Post-coil. Yeah. I mean, timing? It's the yeah. only method that we have right now that you can take after sex to prevent, to try to prevent unintended pregnancy. Okay. The next thing that we need to know is that uh, the dose of EC, the most popular EC available right now is levonorgestrel only, and the dose is 1.5 milligrams a day and w in one pill. And if you have the two pill pack, and I've got samples of both of them, uh, you take both pills at the same time, even though the label says take the first one as soon as possible and the second one 12 hours later. But research conducted by WHO clearly showed that you take them both at the same time and it's much more effective and you don't need to wait. So the one pill looks like this and the two pill pack, which is 750 micrograms, uh, not in there. Not in here. There's the two pill pack. So you take them both at the same time. Um, now, how does it work? Well, it doesn't work if you take it more than four or five days after the unprotected act of intercourse. And how it works, and evidence is very clear on this, it acts like oral contraception. It prevents ovulation or, uh, prevents ovulation or delays ovulation as long as you take it before the hormone LH peaks. That's the hormone that stimulates uh, ovulation. If you take it before then, you have a good chance of working. If you take it after the LH peak, it will not work. So most women do not know where they are in their cycles when they have a, uh, an act of unprotected intercourse. And hence the, gui the guidelines are, take it. Don't worry about where you are because we know it isn't going to harm you. And we know it has a chance of preventing an unintended pregnancy. And that effectiveness rate is somewhere between 60 and 90 percent. Um, the interesting thing about emergency contraception is we never could do a clinical trial like you do with all other methods, where you use this method and you use another method only, and then you see if, it, if you prevent pregnancy. You can't use emergency contraception like that. So we have, a, we have an estimate of what would the likelihood be if you had unprotected intercourse during the middle two weeks of your cycle uh, or around the time of ovulation, and then how much protection do you get from this? So WHO has done these large studies, and we come up with this figure, uh, somewhere between 60 and 90 percent effective. And uh, the recommendation is take it as soon as possible after the uh, unprotected act of intercourse. There is a new product on the market. It's called ELA-1 in the United States, or ELA in the rest of the world. And that is made of a, of a, a very interesting antiprogestin. It is not like RU486. It's, was it was synthesized so that it had very less effect on the endometrium than RU486 or mifepristone has. And it works, uh, it's more effective than levonorgestrel and it works a little bit later. So it will still work at the time of the LHP <coughs> but not after ovulation. Uh, whereas levonorgestrel, if you don't take it before the LH peak, it will not work. 
So it gives you another day of protection. It costs a lot more money. And getting back to that question that Caitlin astutely asked, and that is, if you look at the label on emergency contraception, even that approved by the FDA, the label still says can prevent implantation. There is not one shred of evidence that it prevents implantation. However, that was the original thought of how it works before the studies were done to get a better idea of actually how it does work. And one of the world leaders in doing that research is a guy named Horacio Cruxado in Chile. And he, he's a marvelous scientist. It was a marvelous scientist. He's not well right now. And he was very intent on doing that research because all the women that they treated in a 97% Catholic country, they didn't want to use anything that would be considered um, to prevent implantation, which they defined as abortion. Now, I'm, I'm going to make a mention of that, and we certainly have it clear in the background documents that I provided about what, what is abortion. So he did the research to show that it actually had no effect on implantation, and if you take it after ovulation, it has no effect at all. And we tell women, you can't take it to induce, bring on your period, because it won't work. But people will try anything if they think there's a possibility. So the same applies to this LO1, uh, which is ulipristal acetate. We don't have any evidence that it would block implantation, but the mechanism by which it works is one that would be more likely to possibly block implantation, although we don't have any evidence of that. We do not provide that product. Uh, it's not really available in the public sector. Uh, and I think it will soon become available in the public sector. Um, so, any questions about emergency contraception? Everybody clear? And I have these, pro we can circulate these. If you, if, are we circulating one of them right now? Here's a single pill pack. Keep it with it. Yeah. <coughs> And this is the L1. Let's take it out of the pack. Let's take it out of the pack. We don't need to circulate that. And I should tell you, by the way, the original. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I didn't see I you. Just have a quick question. I remember hearing that if you take two pills out of uh, a regular pregnancy, yeah. then that would work. With you. No, you need to take at least four, and you need to take them twice. So you need eight of them. So originally, before emergency contraception was widely available, many people cut up pill packs because it really is dirt cheap and you can cut them up. So that to get the right dose, depending on, you have to look at the dose of levonorgestrel in the pill pack so that you could count that you would have a total of 1.5 milligrams. So that's what you need to do. And people used to take the entire pack, all 20 of the progestin only pills that we provide because that would also work. But that's a lot of pills. Uh, so the original or, um, emergency contraception was called the USP method. I didn't mention that. And that was using combined. So Al USP in Canada discovered that you could prevent uh, pregnancy with emergency contraception if you took a high dose of progesterone and estrogen. So took a high dose pill, 50 micrograms of estrogen. We don't provide that level anymore. And he called it the USB method. And the first one on the market in the United States was called Preven. And almost nobody uses that product because that product has a very much higher degree of nausea and vomiting when you take the higher dose estrogen and progesterone together. So the progestin only has a much lower incidence of nausea and vomiting. And so there's no, um, the, they do progesterone only because the estrogen has no effect on or just like it did have an effect, but it, you didn't need it. Didn't need I mean, it. it did have an effect, but you, we found out, WHO found out you didn't need it. Just take the progestin only, and it, it's, just, it's even more effective and f many fewer side effects. Because if you're taking this pill to prevent an unintended pregnancy and you throw it up, well, what do you do? You take another one, it makes you throw up. So you're not getting the pill in your body. So it's, I don't know if anybody's using uh, cut-up pill packs, and I don't think in the U.S. Prevent is being sold and everybody's moved to progestin only uh, pills. And uh, this uh, technical guidance to the field really talks about all of the legal issues, the policy issues, and Bev, bless her heart, was the final editor of this version of the document that I worked on and she, she made it right. So, uh, and it also mentions key resources, uh, who contacted aid if you're interested in 
these issues, and we'd probably already be changing that, Bev, <laughs> because they're not going to contact you anymore for policy issues, although they could. So we could, we could make, we could make another version of this document. Might be updated um, resources too that we should look at from ICC. Yeah, but this Why is not? yeah, they're all it's all, but it's we we have so many, so we have so much. Uh, uh, material and one of the pieces that I gave you also deal, talks about Uli Pristol. Okay, next on our agenda. So, go ahead. One of the questions that came up last time, from please, again, was about women with high BMI and EC and whether or not they should be considered oh, on EC. Yeah. So, why don't you tell us what happened at the ICEC, Kara? <laughs> So the International Consortium for Emergency Contraception has a jamboree every year. And I have been going to that for many years um, for aid. And I couldn't go this year. And Kara went. And Kara got attacked at that meeting. <laughs> so what did they want to know and how did you deal with it? No, but they attacked about multiple other issues not okay. related to the BMI issue. <laughs> oh, yeah. But go ahead. They gave us a hard time about two things. One was that we um, work with FBOs um, because it was not clear to them. We, we, now, I was told the exact phrase I'm supposed to use about working with FBOs, but basically the phrase is that everyone, anyone that we work with signs a document which mm -hmm. says that they either will provide all methods or will refer to other organizations that will provide all methods. So when we were out of the room um, or not participating in the conversation, that became a huge issue about USAID. Um, and then the other main issue, what was the issue about that? Yeah. That we work with FBOs, and so clearly we work, um, the people we work with are not getting appropriate counseling about um, that they weren't contraceptive. That we weren't um, like enforcing that. Enforcing that. that. And then the other issue was about um, the DHS and whether or not we were um, basically how Including DC as a had been cut out of the DHS because of the new um, the edits to it. But thankfully, um, our uh, DHS colleagues were able to refute that so we could present the next day that in the new updated DHS, the questions about EC would be in there and it would, we would have the appropriate data. The whole reason I brought up that meeting was for you to talk about the BMI Okay, issue. so there is some concern <laughs> that women with a BMI of above 30, so that's body mass index. Most people do not know their BMI. They know their height and they know their weight, so you can calculate your BMI. But it's largely the issue is obese women might have much less effectiveness with EC should they use it. And the Brits came out with a statement that said no. So the jury is really out on how much reduction of effectiveness you have with a high BMI. Uh, it's just that we need to warn people that you know, the best thing to do is you use routine contraception and then you don't need to rely on emergency contraception. But should you rely on emergency contraception and you're overweight, uh, then it might not be as effective as you would hope it would be. It's the pills, but if they were to use the IUD as EC, which we've has no effect on body weight. No problem. Yeah. So can we talk about um, those who may regularly use EC and effectiveness of EC okay. and how they're counseled on that? Okay. So that is another issue that came up that we dealt with from the field last week, I think it was. Uh, so we don't recommend it as a routine method. Uh, and Jim Shelton has a very nice article that he could share with all of you that he wrote on routine use of emergency contraception. So there are a group of women who might choose to not use routine contraception and use emergency contraception as their, as their main method. Uh, the kind of women who might want to do that have very infrequent sex, uh, so they don't have a high risk of pregnancy all the time. You know you don't have a high risk of pregnancy outside the fertile period anyhow. So uh, as long as you don't do it, use it more than a couple of times a month, it could provide you with protection, not as much protection as routine contraception, and it won't mess up your cycle. But if you were to take EC three, four times a month, your cycle, you'll have great irregularity and you'll, you'll, you'll be cycling normally. So you don't know where you are until you restabilize. So uh, we don't recommend it as a routine method. And there's a, in terms of future contraception, we have a lot of interest in what we call pericoidal contraception. And how could you incorporate some kind of an effective contraceptive method for people who don't want to contracept all the time and, and they don't need to use barrier methods because they're not at risk of anything other than 
pre unintended pregnancy. And WHO has just completed a very large study looking at the use of levonorgestrel as, in for, as a pericoidal method that you would take before intercourse if you knew you were going to have intercourse or immediately after, and you can take it five times in a month in that trial. So they've just completed that big study, and we're waiting for the results of that trial to see how well it worked, what were the pregnancy rates, and what were the side effects. And that's just mm -hmm. essentially the same as you see? There's yes, no it's the effect. same pill, yeah. And, and each dose is, uh, I think it was 750 micrograms per dose, I think, in that study. I'd so have to that check. Will, like, show us. We, so we don't know now, like, say, for instance, if someone's using um, EC as their, their primary method, um, and they're using it a couple of times a month, do we know whether it gets less effective because of the, you know, like the, the pregnancy, you know? No, I think the pregnancy rate stays the same at each, for each act. And, and the other big issue with EC is that it doesn't protect for the next unprotected act. So if you have an unprotected right. act today and you take EC tonight, uh, and then you have another unprotected act in four days, that EC isn't going to protect, so you need to take it again. Uh, so we try to use the use of EC as a point of departure to discuss um, with women, are you, you know, are you using a routine method and why not use a routine method? Um, um, can you talk about IUD as EC, or are you going to get into it? Well, we can do it when we get to the IUD, okay? Oh, oh, you want to do it now? Okay. Right? Okay. So the IUD um, has been known um, as an effective method for emergency contraception. It is much more effective than the pill, than leaving adjustable pills. And um, we were always very concerned, at least I was very concerned, about doing anything about IUDs for emergency contraception because we make this case that IUDs work uh, by preventing fertilization. They don't block implantation. We have tremendous evidence when used as a contraceptive method, it has no impact at all when it gets to IUDs. However, if you use an IUD, if you have an unprotected active intercourse and you insert an IUD, uh, it, it works for at least five or six days, and it could have an effect after, uh, it does have, an, it could, can have an effect after ovulation, and hence you could have fertilization. So we were always very skittish about it, but there's been a lot of research done on the method, and uh, a big clinical trial was done, and there's a big, there's a systematic review done, and we really can't hide from the fact that it is an appropriate method for some women. And we're working on a training material right now with, through CIFPO uh, to make sure that at least people know um, how to use, how you would use it and what would be the criteria for using it. And there's a, we, you know, we have something called the pregnancy checklist. Have, who's heard about the pregnancy checklist? Okay, so maybe that's another document we should provide to everybody new. There's a pregnancy checklist. So I'll just, just jump qu quickly to that. So uh, John Stanbeck at FHI discovered that the major reason that women were denied contraception was they weren't menstruating at the time of the visit. And we know very well, and he did a big study in Kenya on this, you know very well if you don't serve a woman, a woman when she, you have her, you may never get her again. So he ended up, he found out that the major reason for denial of contraception in Kenya, but it's everywhere, was you're not menstruating and they want to make sure that you're menstruating before you start a product. So they'll tell you to go home and use, use condoms until you get your period and then we're going to give you something else. So he did this study and he created a checklist and that checklist essentially eliminated uh, through a, an easy to use checklist the likelihood that you are, uh, that you could be pregnant. For instance, you didn't have intercourse since the last time you, uh, since, since, you've, since, since the visit. No chance of pregnancy. So there's a, he has this nice checklist, and after the completion of that study, it was considered the most uh, powerful uh, piece of information that we had ever shown in a family planning program to increase the take-home rate. When they instituted the checklist, 30% more women went home with a contraceptive method than before the pregnancy checklist. So we've got deal with IUDs, we deal with the pregnancy checklist, we got to make sure that you all have uh, that pregnancy checklist. So let's move to injectables. Oh? Whoop, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Jeff, this is 
this is Amy on the phone. I just wanted to let you all know that uh, FHI is continuing that work by putting the checklist um, uh, on a mobile app in several languages. So when that's ready, I'll send that out to everyone. Great. It's mostly for CHWs to use, but um, any provider could use it. So we'll send that out. Uh, they're almost completed. Yeah. And we need to probably, uh, Elaine, we probably need to send that check when we're done with our checklist and everything's done on the use of the IUD. And it's, it's very much related to the pregnancy checklist, the way it's set up. We need to make sure that everybody has that also. Uh, back to the IUD for a minute. Uh, in most of the countries that we work, it's very impractical to think of the IUD as a method of emergency contraception. One, in much of sub-Saharan Africa, it's very hard to get an IUD. Uh, and even though, uh, even though PSI, with a large grant uh, from the Dutch government and from the Buffett Foundation, I will, won't say large anonymous donor, because for those of you who know, the large anonymous donor is the Buffett Foundation. They have done amazing work to demonstrate that if you put all the pieces together, you have trained providers and the methods available, you can really increase IUD use in countries where this use is very constrained. So, but it really, it takes an effort. In most programs, we don't have that effort. So IUDs are still totally underutilized in most of Sub-Saharan Africa. So if you wanted to use an IUD for emergency contraception, and you were living in a country where it's hard to get an IUD, you'd, first you'd have to find an IUD provider. Secondly, we make it very clear uh, in the document that should you use an IUD, uh, for emergency contraception, they, the provider needs to counsel the woman that this should now become her routine method. It would be very cost ineffective to put it in and then no pregnancy and then remove it. You need routine contraception, you've accepted the IUD, keep it in and you will not ever have a fear of an unintended pregnancy. So that, there's the programmatic side of the use of that method and maybe that would be a good way to lead into more use of a very highly effective uh, method of contraception and accepted by half of China. When we give you the, when we give you the, uh, ins the use, worldwide use of IUDs, uh, we always remove China from that list because about half the IUDs in the world are China. It's a favorite method in China right now. So, okay, let's move to injectables. So. We have, uh, we have about, we have one, two, three, four documents on injectables. And they include uh, the injectable briefer, and uh, they include the literature review on injectables, and they re and include two documents on Cyana Press. So, do you all have that? No. What don't you have? Oh, no, I think uh, there should be two of um, Cyanopress Press there. Yeah. Now, there was, o yeah, there was only, uh, I made 26 of most documents, and I don't think we're more than that number of people. So the second piece on Cyanopress Press uh, is, the, is this one. So there's two, there's two sheets. One, I don't think you have, you have the, all have the color versions. They look like this. Okay, so let's just start off with, um, with uh, injectables. Uh, so, uh, yeah. go ahead. So can I ask a question? This is Ann on the phone. Please. Um, first of all, I'm sorry I'm not there. Person, I have like contractors in the basement uh, filling up my sewage line. But anyway, oh, <laughs> so okay. Call in, but I have question on pills. Can I ask it real quick? Of course. Injectables. Of course. Um, what, do you, what do you think about USAID advocating for kind of over-the-counter uh, distribution of pills? And like, like in Thailand, you know, they have you can buy pills at 7-Eleven. Yes. You can buy pills anywhere. What do you, I mean, I know that in a lot of countries, you um, know, you can buy, even if it's supposed to be by prescription, you can go into pharmacies and get it anyway. But what about uh, USAID advocating for, you know, well, distribution of, or not free, well, you know, I, I, non prescription um, We already do it. The fact is, it's only in the United States that you need a prescription, that you actually have to use the prescription to get the pill. Prescriptions are required elsewhere too, and including in some developing countries, but nobody follows that rule. And in fact, we've had a huge movement in the United States to go to the FDA to get pills over the counter. 
We got EC over the counter, and we now need pills over the counter. And the problem is that the pharmaceutical companies don't really care because it sort of protects them to have by prescription only. But I can tell you that there's more negative evidence of the effect of aspirin, Tylenol, and ibuprofen than there is on the pill. It is the most single, the most studied drug in history. And there's no reason that it shouldn't be over the counter. And throughout all the world, everywhere I've traveled, you can get pills everywhere. We've got, you know, in social market, sorry, not only in social marketing, but in, in distribution programs. For instance, in India, uh, Malady is the, it's called Malady, is the, um, is the pill that's given out by, a, by given out by A&Ms, and nobody does it by prescription. You can get them anywhere. So we do not, and we, pills should not be by prescription, and we ought not worry about that. And we don't worry about okay. it. Yeah. yeah. Use are sometimes asked, like in the Philippines, they're usually going, yeah. well, where's your prescription? Yeah. So, uh, yes. even though it's, it's not well, that's, all of yeah, that's, some groups, I think there's a barrier. That's ageism, and it's particularly terrible when you have a very young married woman, and we know about the problem of the child bride. I mean, she has, she's one of the most disadvantaged, disadvantaged women in the world. You know, she's, programs won't deal with her. So we, yeah, for youth too, I mean, it's, it's totally appropriate and uh, it should be made widely available. So moving on to injectables. So the first piece is the uh, progestin only injectables DMPA. And that tells you everything you need to know about depo-medroxyprogesterone depo acetate. So the drug is magesterone, <laughs> magesterone, <laughs> God almighty, I'm tongue tied. Uh, the drug is medroxyprogesterone, and DEPO means it's an injection, okay? So that drug, MPA, is well known, it's been well studied, and I've got a ton of information in this form about it, in which countries use it most widely, and it comes provided with a vial and an auto-disable syringe. So we shake the syringe. The providers thought you just shake that syringe. You don't want to really shake it hard because it could froth. And then you turn it upside down and then you use an auto-disable syringe to draw it out. Now this auto-disable syringe has already been used, so I can't use it again. But what you can do is you draw it out of the vial and you just watch it draw every bit of it out and it's been overdosed by a tenth of a cc. So there's a teeny bit left, but you're going to get the full 150 milligrams. And then you inject it intramuscularly. In these auto-disabled syringes, once you've injected it, you can't pull the plunger back out. That's the advantage of auto-disabled. It can't be used again. And we only, provided, we only provide DMPA. We, we buy it from, from Pfizer, and hence it's called Depo-Provera. The generic name is DMPA. And we buy, we, we buy it. Um, with a vial, an auto disable syringe, and a safe disposal box for 100 syringes. And that's how we package it. We were the only donor that f packaged it all together. So we made sure that we had the auto disable syringe and we had a disposal, safe disposal box. And uh, we have been providing Depo Provera since the 90s, and it's very popular. Uh, it lasts for three months. And the reinjection window is actually a month, although it says in all the papers two weeks. But we know for a fact, reinjection window, you, it actually lasts four months. So you need to have your reinjection within, within four weeks after the third month of use. Okay, so it really lasts for four months. You don't want to go longer than four months. And you can reinject one week early if you want. So widely, very popular, highly effective can be used very discreetly for women who do not want their partners to know that they are contracepting. One of the best methods because there's no way your partner will know that. Highly effective. Uh, and, uh, and, and this the one sheet I gave you tells you what we pay 80 cents for this combination um, right now. And, uh, and um, so it's private, it's certainly, it's unrelated to your, once you've got an injection, 
your behavior is not going to affect how effective the product is as long as you get re-injected. So the new, the new guy on the block is Cyanopress. Now, who has heard about that? Is, is Jeff, um, has, I, has any, um, has uh, Depo been used for EC? No. Like, have people like said, hey, can I go after, have it been studied? Like, no. uh, you know, unprotected sex and just get an injection that works the same? I mean, you couldn't, want, you couldn't do it over and over. Yeah. Like, as a, like a yeah, I don't think we've ever, you know, I don't think it's ever been studied. It hasn't that ever seems been studied. So readily available. That mm -hmm. seems like it might be in. It's a good question. Well, I would think it would definitely work, but it's never been studied for emergency contraception. And the only thing we don't want to do is inject it into a pregnant woman, although there's no evidence at all that would have any impact on the fetus should you be pregnant and, and be using Depo. But it's just good practice not to, uh, not to, uh, not to use it if somebody's already pregnant. Um, no effect on breastfeeding, because there's no estrogen in it. And uh, disadvantages are, you know, again, no protection from HIV. There's a delay in return of fertility. Go ahead. Yeah, Jeff, um, years ago when, when, um, when Depo was first out, there was some question around how soon could you start it after birth. You know, okay. I did a case study on the combination of lamb and Depo in Bolivia. Lamb was like number one preferred and Depo was second. Yeah. yeah but, the, but still, I mean, is there any sort of resolution of when well, you can start it after Well, we've had, I'm glad you asked that. It, it, it applies to all progestin-only methods. Right now, WHO has a medical eligibility criteria, and I don't know if we gave everybody the wheel. Are we giving everybody the wheel? The MEC wheel? Okay, so we're going to get you all the medical eligibility criteria wheel, which gives you all methods and what is the recommendation under different conditions. So WHO considers that you, uh, you can't use the progestin method until six weeks after birth. When the U.S. medical eligibility criteria says you can use it immediately, and the U.K., Medical eligibility criteria says you can use it immediately. And the last steering committee of the medical eligibility criteria, WHO, reviewed the evidence. And we won't know until March, I think, what the result was. But I am quite confident, uh, particularly given the amount of pressure I've placed on WHO on this issue, as well as, as, well as many others, is that uh, women can start using a progestin method as soon as, uh, right? immediately postpartum or soon, or soon thereafter, within 48 hours. There's no evidence for it. The only concern was a, um, was a hypothetical effect seen in some animals of some effect on brain. And everybody was worried about that, but there's a complete, there's no data for it, and I'm quite convinced that it will, the medical eligibility criteria will be changed for immediate postpartum uh, use, as it should be. And it is right now. So uh, there's a few other. Go ahead, please. I have a question Beth. about the different. Um, we talked about uh, progestin only oral contraceptives, and then the progestin only EC. And now we have progestin only um, DMPA. And implants. And implants, we're going to get to. Right. So, what's the difference in all of the amounts of progesterone that's daily, and what this effect does that have on effectiveness? Okay. So, um, Inside. If I were to show slides, maybe I will next time I do this, if I do it again, I would show you a pharmacokinetic profile. So it's how the body uh, metabolizes the drug. And when you take an OC daily, what happens is you ingest it, and then a short time later you start to get a spike, and you get your maximum blood levels, and by the next day it's down to almost nothing. You take another pill, you get a spike goes down to almost nothing. So that's why you need to take it every day. And if you miss a day, you're supposed to take two pills the next day. Mm -hmm. OK, so we have all these guidance, what to do with a missed pill. And that, I hope everybody's going to take the, the, um, the, the, um, the, uh, the green book on you know, family planning 
guidance for providers. It tells you all that right in there. It's a marvelous resource. It's really our Bible. Uh, Global Handbook for Providers. So that's OCs. Now, how does injectables? So it's all related to the dose and how it is administered. The doses are different in every one of these products. So Depo, if you were to do a pharmacokinetic profile at Depo, well, what happens is you, take the sh you get a shot, and all of a sudden your MPA levels go really high up, and over a, 30, over a three to four month period it decays. And it starts to come down and it looks like this. And after four months, you still, after three months, you still have a dose high enough in your blood to prevent pregnancy. And we now know after four months you do, but then it starts to fall down. So that's called a first order release. High dose, drops down. Implants, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, has what's called zero order release. You put it in the body and you get a little bit of a surge, but very low, and then, so it goes from nothing up like that, and then it's almost steady state, and it's called zero order release. It just stays steady until there's no drug left, and that's five years uh, for implants, and it's three to four months. So for implants and vaginal rings work the same way. So any of these longer acting preparations that are non-injectables have the zero order release. So the dose is much lower. That's a 20 microgram a day dose. So it is much lower depending on, the depending on how it's administered. So with injectables, there's uh, on the back sheet of the primary piece, uh, it talks about uh, DMPA and risk of HIV. Uh, DMPA risk of STIs, and DMPA and bone loss. So uh, I can't help but mention HIV. Uh, there is some evidence that DMPA use could be associated with the increased acquisition of HIV. The jury is out on that issue. Right now, the WHO um, guidance and our own guidance to the field is be aware of the fact that people at high risk could possibly have a higher um, um, acquisition rate of HIV because of DEPO. We don't know for sure, but there's some evidence that it is possible. So for high risk women, they need to be warned of that, which means that we should be also counseling on condom use. And we should also, in those countries where DEPO is really widely used, like 60% in South Africa, was depo, we should be trying to expand the method mix so women have access to other methods, not just injectables. And um, we will participate uh, with the Gates Foundation um, and other donors in a trial that will start sometimes next year called the ECHO trial, where it's going to be the first randomized uh, open label, so everybody's going to know what they're using, uh, controlled trial of DEPO, IUDs, and JADEL, the implant, the levonorgestrel implant. And the purpose of that trial will be to look at safety, effectiveness, and incidence of HIV in high-risk populations. And we're hoping that that randomized trial will give us better evidence than the observational trials which we're currently using to help guide us on what, what the risk is. Just because we do a random, if a randomized trial doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get an unambiguous result. It's just we got a better chance at an unambiguous result. But confounding, people are going to, people are going to be randomized between those three methods. You don't get the method you really wanted. Do you discontinuation? Do you discontinue earlier? Uh, we, we're very worried about use of condoms. Different methods, people have a higher rate of condom use. So if you don't have the same condom use by each group, you know, we're advising everybody, if you're risk of HIV, use condoms also. So we're going to have to find an, if the incidence of HIV in the presence of people who've been advised to use condoms, but don't use condoms. So it's a very hard kind of a study to do. Uh, and, and, um, and we, you know, we, as long as the discontinuation rates aren't higher amongst certain methods and there isn't a bigger difference in condom use between the different groups, we might be able to get at a better estimate of the real risk of HIV in these three different methods. What's the um, hypothesized now mechanism of action that, that is there's, increasing? There's four of them. 
So I, mean, I, I prefer not to go into it right now, but I can give you all that information because we're never going to get further on. But there's four postula postulated mechanisms, uh, and we don't really know which one. It was originally thought, the first mechanism was it caused thinning of the, of the vaginal epithelium. But that happened in monkeys and didn't happen in women. So, okay, so, so we have, uh, we have Depo, and you've, I've shown that to you, and I'm going to go to cyanopress, but before I do, there's another injectable called Neristerat, net enanthate. Has anybody heard of that? Okay, it's only, it's only used by like two million women in the world. It's made by Bayer. And it comes in these old ampules that you have to have the little saw and you have to break it off. And you put it in, and it's, in an, it's an oil suspension rather than an aqueous suspension. So it's a more painful injection. And you, uh, you need to take it every two months. Although there's some evidence that after the third injection, you can then go to every three months. It's not very widely used. And there's not um, a lot of, we, we never used it because the FDA has never approved it. And, uh, and um, Schering and now Bayer don't want to do what you would need to do to get FDA approval because they have to repeat all the toxicology. It would be very expensive. So that's the other um, injectable. Do you know where it's used in the world? Oh, it's, there's some used in South Africa. I mean, well, I, we, we could ask Bayer. Guatemala? Guatemala? Tell me, yeah. yeah. So they don't, they only have like two million users in the world. Uh, so I want to move to cyanopress. So what, uh, what Pfizer did was uh, they, uh, we've been working with Pfizer since the mid 90s to try to get Depo into Uniject. Does everybody know what Uniject is? So this is what it looks like. It was developed by PATH with USAID funding. In fact, the very first auto-disable syringe called Solo Shot is an invention of USAID because PATH developed it with our money. And they went on to develop Uniject with our funding, and then they sold it to Becton Dickinson, the largest uh, maker of syringes in the world. And it's a, a, you know, so this is what it looks like. I can send it around. That's without the depot in it. And we started working with uh, Pfizer in the mid-90s to say, a project that I was leading, to get them to put um, Depo Provera into it. And the project stalled, uh, and it largely had to do with the preservative that was used, and we couldn't get it in, and uh, we couldn't get it into Uniject and get it to be released properly, and, and they gave up on it. Uh, and that was in the mid-90s. So Depo is no longer... Uh, uh, is a generic product right now. So Pfizer cleverly realizes that uh, if they made a subcutaneous formulation of Depo, they could get a patent that lasts till 2020, and nobody else has that product. So you've now got a proprietary product that nobody else has that's patented, and they market that in the United States as Depo sub-Q104 Provera. In the rest of the world, it is marketed as Cyana, S-A-Y-A-N-A. -A. Uh, as an aside, I wonder why they named it Cyana. Anybody have an idea? Does anybody know how the name Kodak came about? You know, Eastman Kodak? How did the word Kodak come about? So some very clever person figured out that there wasn't a language on earth that couldn't say Kodak. <laughs> and that's how they came up with Kodak. It's like tea, tea, te, chai, che. There it is, the entire world. <laughs> so, they came, so, so I think Cyana was done the same way. Cyana, you can just say it in just about any language. So they ended up putting the subcutaneous formulation into a pre-filled glass syringe and they market in the United States as Depo 104 sub Q, uh, cyan in the rest of the world. And then we started a development program with them to put this subcutaneous formulation into Uniject. And they did it. Uh, and that product is called Cyanopress. Why Cyanopress? Because 
it's cyana, and you press it. So the way you use um, these, I'm going to get one that doesn't have the cyana in it. So that is actually what it looks, this is one with cyana, if you want to speculate that. This one has saline. So the way it's used, very novel, again, Path invented it, um, BD's perfected it. So all you do is you, you press the cap in, and that breaks the hub. Then you take the cap off, and it's a subcutaneous injection. So you can look at the difference between those two needles. Which one would you rather be injected with? <laughs> okay. So by the way, proper recapping, if you ever are to recap a needle, is you never do it with your hands. Because the major way to get infected is with a needle stick. So you lay, it, you lay the cap on the tabletop, and you do it like that. If you ever have to, ever have to recap a needle. We tell people never recap it. Throw it away uncapped. Then you prevent needle sticks. So you make that connection, and then you give this teeny subcutaneous. It can't get into your muscles. The needle is so small. So you just squeeze your upper arm, or your belly, or your thigh. And you then squeeze. It's saline, so I'm not poisoning anything. Pardon? No, it's only in the United States. I'm glad you asked that. Are you a healthcare provider? Well, no, I've worked in healthcare. Okay. Well, in the U.S., you can't sell needles that aren't retractable. So they want the needle to disappear after you've injected, or at least be covered over. No, it doesn't come that way. So they created Cyanopress. Uh, and we have worked with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Bayer, uh, sorry, with Pfizer on this, and you have this one sheet that looks like that, and that tells you almost everything you need to know. You know, it's only 104 milligrams, so it's a third less drug, and it's 0.65 cc's or 65 mLs versus one ml, so it's 35% less fluid. It's given subcutaneously. Um, it's just as effective as the 150 milligram dose. It has the same side effect profile, even though it tends towards being a better profile, but not statistically significant better profile. Uh, the cyanopress uh, was approved by the uh, European Medical Authority, with the British being the regulatory uh, authority. Uh, it's already been registered in several countries. It has not gone to the FDA, nor will it ever go to the FDA for approval. I don't think they feel the need to do that. And one reason they don't feel the need to do that is that their, 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 their uh, advisors tell them there's no market in the United States for Sinopress because we have the prefilled glass syringe. Uh, and I brought uh, the medical advisor of Planned Parenthood with me to a meeting at Pfizer. I'm on the medical advisory panel for Planned Parenthood. And uh, we had this meeting with Pfizer and, and Vanessa Cullen said, are you kidding? We'd love to have this product in, in PPFA <coughs> clinics around the United States. But I don't think it's going to ever be available in the U.S. Uh, and uh, introductory studies have begun uh, in, uh, in five countries, with two more coming on board. We supported the acceptability studies in Senegal and in, U and in Uganda, and overwhelmingly, the clients and the providers preferred Cyanopress over um, DMPA, um, uh, over Depo-Provera. Not universally, but it was definitely the pre preferred thing because it's easier. The all-in-one combination makes, makes it impossible to have vials and no syringes, or syringes and no vials. So it's all in one thing, it can't be reused, and it's a pre-filled dose, you can't make a mistake on the dosing. Uh, and we had a supportive study that showed that if you injected it in the arm, it worked just as well as in the thigh, and in the, in the interior thigh and the abdomen, because that's the label used by the company. And one of the nice things about this is it's also appropriate for self-injection or at-home injection. 
And Pfizer had no interest in that, but now they have an interest in that. So they have supported some research by Anna Glazier in Scotland, and they have an application in front of the, uh, the, of the British Medical Authority uh, for a label change for self-injection. And we're about to embark on three self-injection studies. Um, Victoria, we're, gonna, we're funding one. The mission in Malawi is funding a trial. And uh, the Gates Foundation is supporting PATH to organize trials in Senegal and Uganda on self-injection. And Well, I'm um, very astute remark. So my position has been, I don't want to do self-injection until we have introduction, until providers and the medical people and are all on board, because we could. In, in fact, I've written an editorial. It appeared in the May issue of uh, the Journal of Contraception, which is all about Depo. I wrote the lead editorial on Cyanopress. Press, and I worried about, you know, getting pushback if we got too far out on self-injection. Uh, so uh, the proper approach is to do it through, through uh, facilities and then through community health workers. You know we've been very successful and Victoria Graham has led the effort. There's very few countries that won't let us uh, train community health workers to give intramuscular injections. There are still some holdouts and we think they will change their policy with subcutaneous because there's still this fear that you can go into a vein which just, just doesn't happen. Uh, but there is, uh, uh, with that recognized, there is still, uh, you know, I think both there will be introduction as well as self-injection studies. Uh, and for uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, they, they see the, the game changer, and I call my slide, that slide is called, uh, uh, you know, I, I, it says a potential home run. I used to say game changer, but I thought, you know, that word was used, too overused, game changer. But they, but Bill and Melinda see the game changer is in self-injection. So they want Gates to be doing self-injection. So the other piece there just gives you a very better comparison, if you needed it, on um, what the difference between uh, the two products are, including needle gauge size. So any other questions about injectables? Highly popular method. Density and like how young okay. you recommend well, there, there is a black box warning on the FDA label about loss of bone mineral density. And um, uh, Depo-Provera is the only progestin we use that causes 100% hypoestrogenicity. In other words, your body doesn't make any more estrogen when you're using Depo. Whereas with levonorgestrel, your body still makes estrogen. So it causes hypoestrogenicity. And hypoestrogenicity leads to bone mineral density loss. One reason menopausal women um, who aren't on hormonal replacement therapy can lose bone. Guess what else causes bone mineral density loss? I'm looking down at that end of the table. No. Pregnancy? Breastfeeding. Breastfeeding. Oh. Women produce no estrogens when they breastfeed. And that is transient. You stop breastfeeding, you gain back all that loss. So here was the fear with Depo. You gain back the loss. Your bone grows back. So the fear with Depo was that, that if young women took Depo, they at, before they reached their full bone growth, they might not regain all their bone growth. And that if other women, who weren't young women, that they may have an increase in fracture rates if they're on depo. Well, the evidence is to the contrary, and including on the adolescents. Uh, Pfizer has completed a big study, and it, it looks like it is not an issue, but the black box stays. So it's nothing that we need to worry about. And WHO has a guidance on there it is in no way should affect uh, the use of the product. Okay, shall we move to implants? So, implants. 
we have three documents on implants. We have the one pager that I did. We have the piece that I worked on with on Alana that gives even more evidence on all the implants. And we have the um, training for the introduction of Implon NXT that Trish McDonald just circulated to everybody. Uh, so contraceptive implants. I have in front of us Jadel, which I can circulate in two directions. I have the original Norplant, which was six capsules. It was replaced by Jadel, which is two rods. And I also have Sino Implant, which I mentioned in that thing, uh, which is made by Dao, Dawa in China. And it is a, um, it's a copy of Jadel. It's not exactly like Jadel, but it's a copy of Jadel. And that's the Chinese label, Ch Chinese packaging for um, Sino Implant. No, that's slightly different. Slightly different length than, uh, than uh, Jadel. So, uh, Jadel lasts for five years, highly effective. It's inserted with, uh, with a trocar that looks like that. They're disposable trocars. It looks like a really big needle. Scary. And you don't need to make any kind of incision in the arm. You just, you, you, what you do is you put it in under the, very superficially under the skin. The more superficial the insertion, the easier it is to remove. And then you, once it's in, you put one rod in and you push it in and then you turn it a little bit and you take this plunger out and you put the second rod in and you push that one in so that you have two rods that are under your skin right here. And that's a disposable trocar. Uh, it releases levonorgestrel. It's highly effective for five years. It has the same side effects as progestin only method. It causes some irregular bleeding. Some people become uh, amenorrheic with it. It's highly effective. You need good counseling um, about the side effects before you provide it. Uh, uh, it's safe for breastfeeding. Uh, you have immediate return of fertility as soon as you remove them. Uh, there's m less menstrual bleeding, less risk of ectopic pregnancy. Uh, again, it doesn't protect against HIV. The bleeding pattern changes are the most uh, important side effects, spotting and some heavier bleeding, at least in the first year of use. Uh, it needs to be inserted by trained people and removed by even better trained people. Um, and it does, it's less effective if you use it with uh, certain kinds of drugs, uh, rifampicine uh, and anti-seizure medicines. And there is now concern, and I think we just sent something to the field on that also, that uh, the one of the components of, of triple therapy, ARV therapy, is a favorins. And there's some evidence, uh, and Jim Shelton finds the evidence compelling, although others don't find it so compelling, that you can have 30% reduction uh, uh, in protection uh, against pregnancy if you're taking a favorins and using a levonorgestrel based or antenogestrel based uh, implant. Was it 30%? I think it was 30%. So that's questionable, but it's still highly effective. And if it's still your method of choice, you just need to know that. So I think the jury is out in that WHO, Jim has asked WHO to look into this and the programmatic guidance that we go to the field. And, and, and so we're staying on top of this issue because it is the most, one of the most common methods in triple therapy. It doesn't have to, if you wanted to use an implant and you wanted to be on triple therapy, there are alternatives to efavirenz. Maybe not quite as effective, but so that, that's one of the issues, and I, and I mentioned that in this, in this briefer. So uh, I passed around the Jadel, and we also, and the interesting thing about the product is, uh, and the same with uh, Implanon, is that uh, the manufacturers 
signed uh, after FP, as part of FP 2020, uh, Bayer uh, did a volume guarantee uh, that if the donors and countries bought 27 million in over six years, they are providing it for eight dollars and fifty cents. So the price dropped from eight. The price started at twenty-three dollars, and then we were paying eighteen fifty, and then it dropped to eight dollars and fifty cents uh, for five years of contraception. Very, very low couple-year protection. Merck produces Implanon, which is a single-rod uh, implant. It contains the progestin tanogestrel, a different form of progestin, a later stage progestin. And the advantage is it's just one rod and it's easier to insert because it's one and it's somewhat easier to remove. But for trained inserters, I've got, I have another slide I could give you that shows the average time of insertion and removal. And it isn't that big of a deal. So this product was labeled for three years only. So if you wanted an implant, at least if I wanted an implant, I'd choose to have the two rods and get five years and the one rod and get three years. However, WHO has just completed a very large multi-center trial and they compared uh, Jadel with Implanon and the IUD. And the original design of that study was Implanon was going to be replaced at three years. And uh, I consider one of my... Uh, uh, one of my accomplishments to convince WHO to not do that, to keep the Implanon in, because I, there was already four-year published data on, on effectiveness of Implanon at four years, and I was quite confident that the company knew it lasted five years, but they liked to sell it for three years. Why? Three years is a perfect birth spacing Space. So for birth spacers, you put it in, in three years you take it out and you have your next baby. Three to five saves lives. So I said, yes, three to five saves lives. If you want an implant, it ought to last 30 years if it has to be taken out, if it could. So I got WHO to keep the trial going and to use an increase in pregnancy rate to stop the trial if they saw the pregnancy rates of Implanon after year three increasing compared to Jadel. Well, guess what happened? There were three pregnancies in both groups at three years and no pregnancies in either group between year four and five. So Implanon lasts for five years. It's just as effective in, as in five years as three years. It's even more effective. Uh, and the same effectiveness as as uh, Jadel, and the company has agreed now that when they get all the data and if they can do an audit of the sites where the trial was done, they will go for a five-year label. So if all things were equal and you can get one rod <laughs> for five years, then I'd probably opt for this. But as you can see, there's been a change. And that email that, um, that Trish sent out is what, what the company has done is they've made a new inserter that makes it almost impossible to do a deep insertion. Because we've learned from all the studies that we did, you need to have a very superficial insertion just under the skin, it's easy to get out. You put it deep in the muscle, you gotta fish it out. Mm -hmm. So they've created a new inserter that almost makes it impossible to do a deep insertion. And plus they've added a radio opaque dye to the product. So that if you wanted to make sure it was there, you can x-ray it and find it. Because the, most of the pregnancies that have occurred in implant users, when they studied them, they didn't have any hormone in their system. And what happened, it fell out of the trocar before it was inserted. So nothing got inserted and they didn't know it fell out. <laughs> so that can happen. You gotta keep the angle right. Well, it can happen. It can happen. So now, uh, with the radio opaque dye, you can easily check if you want, make sure that it's there. Uh, of course, you don't need to do that if you're really careful about the insertion. So that's Implanon. We can circulate that. And here's another one. Circulate in both directions. 
Uh, and then there's sino implant. Now the advantage of sino implant, so sino implant was invented, de developed in China, and Marcus Steiner from FHI came across it, and he got the Gates Foundation to give him a grant to study it, and to collect data on it, and to do quality assurance of the manufacturer. And sino implant is just like Jadel, a little bit longer, same release rate, and it only lasts four years. It's labeled for four years of use. The advantage of sino implant, and it's not been approved by the FDA, it's not been approved by the EMA, and it's going to WHO for pre-qualification, and it hasn't received that WHO pre-qualification yet. And the advantage of it originally was it was available for eight dollars. Well, it actually started like a four fifty or five. It worked its way up to eight and eight fifty, when everything else was eighteen dollars. So it would really make, it, make a big difference on how much you could buy. Now with the volume guarantee, they all cost the same. So what's the advantage of sino implant? Well, there are some countries that will not have access to the volume guarantee. So they won't have a low cost implant and they could use sino implant. Secondly, FHI is collecting the data for, to demonstrate that it lasts for five years, not just four years. And, uh, and they feel, and I'm on their advisory board, that part of that volume guarantee, at least on the part of, of uh, Bayer, was to put the kibosh on sino implant. Who would ever buy a five-year two-rod implant from China if you could buy the trade name for the same price? So you would, nobody would do it. I mean, who's going who's gonna to buy a, buy a you, a Yugo, <laughs> if you can get a Mercedes for the same price. Nobody. So uh, they think there's still going to be a market for Sino implant because it, for those countries that can't get um, the other implants at a low cost. And How long is our price that price guarantee going for, too? Well, that price guarantee is six years. However, uh, in my experience, nobody has ever been able to go back to the original price. And the only reason that they would ever go back to the original price is if they had no volumes. So what, 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 what Bayer did is they had the capacity to manufacture many more units than they were. And the price volume guarantee um, got them to make more units. So if you're making a lot more units, the marginal cost of making the additional units is very low. So you can offer it for a lot less money and not lose money. So I think Implants are very popular and they're going to continue to be popular, so I don't think we'll ever see a reversal in those prices. I think people like implants and will continue to use them. Just to give more background, part of the reason why Trish had to send the email is because, well, we have the volume guarantee and the price reduction for the implant on product. The new product has different placebos and they're very costly. The, yeah, training the arms. Plan, the placebo trainers, the, the blanks. Yeah. So Mission's had a plan for that since, and they're five dollars each. So in essence, their price reduction is not as good as. Yeah, I was very disturbed by that. Yeah. So that's part of why we're trying to work with Mission on how they're doing it, making sure they have the money for it. Yeah, well, if you read that, if you have a chance, and if you haven't done it already, take a look at that um, on that release that Trish says, because it's very confusing in many respects, because what's going to happen is. Uh, is um, Merck has agreed to do training of trainers. So they're going to have a ton of trainer, tra train, trainers trained, but the programs that want to take advantage of them have to pay for the trainers to train their own people. And they want you to have a, a, a blank device, and it's expensive to buy that blank device. So we, we got to sort this out, and how many do you really need? Uh, and maybe you only need a couple of them. You know, we don't want to spend much money to do that because the training is the training is really easy. Yeah. I mean, I did. I, I'm not a clinical provider, and I did the Norplan training with six capsules, and I found it very easy. So I went. I did the training for it, and it's, it's a very easy thing to do, particularly if you've got experience already with uh, with, with Implanon. My understanding was also the issue with. Inserter may have huge medical waste issues because it's ginormous. Yeah. We're talking to them about that too, right? Yes. Absolutely. Well, and uh, you know, as I've said, I, w I worry very much about uh, waste, particularly in developing countries, because nothing gets thrown away. 
please. Uh, sorry, I, I forgot to ask about the, your thoughts on cyanopress and the whole chicken and egg thing question, which seems to have been resolved in terms of the, now the price is at $1. Oh, wow. That's better than it has been, but it's still not around the 80 cents. What are, what are your thoughts as to well, uh, most people don't know, and I will share with you, that it's one dollar because um, the Gates Foundation and the Children's Investment Fund Foundation are buying the price down. That's why it's a dollar. And the company says they will provide it for a dollar when they reach about volumes of six to eight million a year. But it's going to take us a long time to ramp up to that level of volume. Because it doesn't happen overnight, and, and programs will try it, but it takes a long time to get a lot of use. So we're doing these introductory studies. So if the volumes do get up, and if it's found to be really popular, uh, then when they get to the volumes, they will, at a certain volume, they will provide it at that amount of money. Because they're figuring out how to make it cheaper and cheaper as they go along by making more volume right now. So the intent is to get it down, and we're working with somebody else that could possibly give us the same product for about 80 cents. <coughs> so it is an important issue. Right now, for the dollar, it's worth, it's worth it to pay a little bit more to at least get some program experience with it. And as I said, the home injection issue and also the community health worker. It's really a piece of cake. Uh, and it, it might expand the use of it in, in, amongst community health workers compared to uh, intramuscular injection. Okay, so the next product on our list are IUDs, are they not? I don't know where I put my little agenda. Okay. So uh, for IUDs, you've got, you've got my one pager, well, it's actually two pages, front and back. You've got the research, the literature review. So you've got those two documents. Uh, and uh, USAID buys the Copper 380 IUD, and we buy it from, uh, from uh, Injuflex. It's called the Optima IUD. I'll pass it around so you can see what it is. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art IUD. Um, it, IUDs do not block implantation, as I said before. They create a hostile environment for sperm in the uterus, and that's what the copper does. So sperm function is destroyed. Fertilization does not occur when a woman is using a copper IUD for interval use. Uh, <coughs> and and that, that's an important piece. We pay 63 cents for that IUD and it lasts 12 years. Okay, I think it's labeled right now at 10, but we have at least 12 years of data, and WHO has 14 years of data on that product. Uh, and most people don't, you know, it, it's a terminal method for many, depending on when you use it. You don't need another method. It works regardless of your behavior. It's uh, the most cost-effective contraceptive method that we have. Uh, approximately 145 million users worldwide, uh, and I list the countries where it's widely used. It's highly effective. It's going to work regardless of what, you, what your behavior is. It's good for spacers and limiters because the spacer just has it removed. Uh, you have immediate return to fer uh, fertility when you remove it. By the way, with Depo, there is a delayed return to fertility if you read that sign, and it can take up so remember, after your last injection, you've got four months of protection, mm -hmm. and probably a little bit more. So you couldn't possibly get pregnant for four months. And it takes usually another six to eight months to, for everybody who's going to get pregnant to get pregnant again. So it could take, after your last injection, you've got 12 months to, to get a normal fertility rate, and people need to be told that. Uh, but it doesn't cause infertility. So. Um, For IUD use, well, if you wanted to use it to delay and you wanted your child in three years, you'd take it out in two years. The depo, you stop your depo. This doesn't have any effect. The IUD is none. Right, for the IUD. IUD, there's no effect at all. 
it's immediate return to fertility. I'm saying for depo, if, you, if you're using it to space and you want to use it all the time, you just you want to stop it a year before you want your next child to, to make sure that you were, you, you were fertile when you wanted to be fertile. IUDs, you have immediate return to fertility. Um, PID, there's very low incidence of PID, and Jim's done a review of that, and WHO's done a review of it, but there is an increase, particularly if you insert an IUD in somebody who has chlamydia or gonorrhea or any uh, reproductive tract infection, because you could bring it in with the IUD insertion. Ectopic pregnancy rate is much lower in IUD users than the users of no method. However, should you become pregnant while using an IUD, then the chance of an ectopic pregnancy is relatively high. So women who do become pregnant and, uh, and the IUD is in place need to be investigated for ectopic pregnancy. People worry about the expulsion rate on IUDs. I don't worry about it. I, o I don't worry about it because the only expulsion that is really uh, worrisome is the unknown expulsion. And women are usually told to check for the string. Occasionally check to make sure you can find the monofilament string. And if you can't, then you need to go to your healthcare provider. But the expulsion rate is relatively low and it's very much related to quality of insertion. Okay, yeah, so for one country only, right? Uh, Pakistan. Pakistan, okay. See, yeah, I knew that. Yeah. I should have said that, but it's only one country we're buying pregnancy. And it's the same IUD. It looks exactly the same. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, FHI did two important studies. Uh, there was a concern that IUDs could not be used by nulliparous women because they caused them to be infertile. W, uh, FHI did a big study in Mexico, showed no relationship between IUDs and infertility. Uh, there was a concern that IUDs couldn't be used by women with a, who had HIV. FHI did a big study in Kenya, and the uh, IUD did not uh, cause an increase in acquisition of HIV, and in women who had HIV and it was inserted in them, did not cause an increase in progression of HIV. So they're totally appropriate for use in, uh, in high incidence of HIV and in women with HIV. The, uh, so that is the, um, we, we buy that copper 380. And I want to also talk about the leaving adjuster releasing IUS. Has everybody heard of that? What's it sold as? Mirena. This is what Mirena looks like. So the only difference between Morena and the LNG IUS. I have one of each. It has zero to do with the device. They, they are exact same. Leave an adjuster releasing IUS, intrauterine system. It's the inserter. Morena has a single hand inserter system. And they're even improving on that. So you can insert with one hand. The LNG IUS has a tube inserter. You usually need two hands to insert with that. It's very similar to another IUD insertion. Experienced providers have zero problem with this. The debutants, or the new providers, find it a lot easier to have the expensive inserter. Uh, I call the LNG IUS the best of both worlds. It brings together all the advantages of oral contraception and all the advantages of intrauterine con contraception into one device and this device has important other health benefits besides contraception. You heard me talk about the fact that with oral contraception, you have a much lower incidence of, uh, of endometrial and ovarian cancer. Okay, so that's a very positive, uh, important effects. With the LNG IUS, you have a, a, you have a product that's very, effective to reduce menorrhagia, very effective in women who are anemic. Severely anemic women, you would not put a copper IUD in because it causes more bleeding and their hemoglobin drops. You put a Mirena in them and the hemoglobin rises. Uh, uh, 
um, a guy named Luis Bahamondes, a famous research scientist in Brazil, did an interesting study. He took all women waiting for hysterectomies because of fibroids and he inserted the LNG IUS in all those women. And 60% of them never had their hysterectomies. It reduces fibroids. Very interesting. Uh, highly effective uh, when, the, when Jeffrey Pipert from the University of uh, Washington in St. Louis did his big study called the CHOICE study. Some of you may have read about it. Uh, the, the, uh, the Buffett Foundation provided them with fr free contraceptives <coughs> and they offered in all their clinics free contraception, any method that a woman wants uh, in a dozen clinics and at no cost. And when cost was taken away from the uh, equation, the highest chosen method was Mirena. In the United States, it's $700 to $800. So, and it's not covered by all insurance. So uh, the most popular methods in his study were long-acting reversible methods, particularly amongst younger women. And they also demonstrated a reduced rate of abortion in those women because of long-acting reversible contraception. The study was a bit biased in favor of long-acting reversible methods, uh, although they offered all methods. But this device is a marvelous device. And uh, in the briefer, I have the website for the ICA Foundation. I sit on the board of that foundation. It was created by the POP Council. And it's in the one pager, one and a half pager. Uh, thank Pardon? We only buy copper because it's, it's marvelous and it's very cheap. And we can't get a public sector price for this product. Okay, so the, LN, the ICA Foundation will provide them free to programs in developing countries who want to get some experience with them. And I put the website down, so if you're in a country that would be interested in trying it, develop, putting a project proposal in is a very easy thing to do. You want to ask me a question about this? Um, I just wonder if we have any data about follow-up, like how many of those women kept it in for five years. I personally, oh. I personally got Marina put in, and it hurt like hell. So the pelvic pain was like excruciating, and I got it, and it was expensive, and I got it taken out two years later because we felt it during intercourse. That's crazy, right? But like, I what wonder, did you feel? So it hurt really bad. It was really expensive. But I'm like, okay, I have it in. I want it for five years, right? But then we... The we pain didn't subside because the pain usually subsides. In we felt, like, during intercourse, we, like... Oh, really? Yeah. So you can clip the string. First of all... They said, I went back, and they said they can't cut them anymore because then they'll tuck behind the cervix, and then you can't get them or something. No. I don't I know who told you that. I had a very bad experience with Marina. Well, so boy. I'm just wondering, like, women... It's I like want a you to... a great option, but if... I wonder if you follow up with these women... <laughs> well, keep it in, you know? so here's the string. So you can see right now that yeah. this is how long the string is. <laughs> so they cut the string <laughs> they after cut. they insert it. Yeah. But yeah. you can cut the string off completely. The only thing they can't do is tell. But we can tell that you have it in your body because all you need to do is take a blood sample and you'll get levonorgestrel in the blood. So we have a biomarker for use. But if I were you, I mean, I don't know who, what provider told you, they could have cut that string off completely. Yeah. They how would they take it out then? Huh? How would they take it out then? They take it out with a um, with with a grasping forceps. Um, mm, <laughs> because women could take them out themselves. But I also heard yeah, so, yeah, so you also say they're appropriate for spacers and limiters, but you don't say delayers. And I know that it's well, it's that's, less pain after you've gone through childbirth. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, I can tell you that there is a new product on the market. Who knows what it's called? Come on. Just what reached, the FDA just provided information about it. It's approved this year, last year, or the, maybe this year, early this year. What's it called? Skyla. And what is Skyla? Noliparous women. It's a smaller device. Are you noliparous? Caitlin, are you noliparous? Have you had a, have you had a child yet? 
No. So you so Scott like, oh, so Skyla So I I want to tell you something. Like I'm going to give you I'm going to tell you who to contact. They were If you're if you're interested, Caitlin, I'll get you a Skyla. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's Obamacare. So I think it's I, I think your experience was um, is not I've not heard that, but everybody has their own experience. So, so that's the LNG US and Marana. There is two other options available right now. One of them is made by Pregna. It's called Alora. It has not been widely studied. It's only available in India. And it's a very similar device. I'll circulate that. And there is uh, uh, NovoCert, which is an IUD that's made in Belgium. It's now, it was made by a company called Uteron. Isn't that a nice name for a company that makes an interuterine device? U-T-E-R-O-N, but it was bought by activists. And Medicines 360, an organization in the United States led by Victoria Hale, who began One World Health, if you ever remember hearing about that. She has got a grant from the Buffett Foundation to do the clinical trials in the United States. Uh, Paul Blumenthal, who is the um, medical, uh, advi medical director for PSI, particularly for this large grant that they have on IUDs and, and implants. Uh, he was one of the investigators in the clinical trial. They've um, got three-year data, and the FD, it's gone to the FDA for three-year approval. It was approved in Portugal for five years already, based on the release rates. Uh, Medicine 360 will continue the trial for five years, so they have five-year data. So anybody who would have the device inserted next year, for instance, uh, by the time they've got one year of use, they've got a four-year label. And by the time they have two-year use, they get five-year label. So anybody who would get the device with the three-year label would be told by the time, if you want to continue to use it, by the time you get to year three, we'll be able to have a label change. And uh, Medicine 360s has worldwide rights to the product. Activist is going to sell it in Europe uh, and the United States and, and uh, Canada. And Medicine 360 can sell it anywhere. They pay a royalty per device, and they are working on some introductory studies in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa on that device right now. And it, my guess is when it's available, uh, it will be probably for around $15. So very different than Marana. Not different than the LNG IUS, because you can get that for free right now. And I've been talking to a Bayer about, a, about why don't they consider dropping the price of Marana drastically. And please. On the implants, it's released, it, it comes out of the tube, not the ends. It just diverts, and, like, and just like Mirena, it doesn't come out from the ends, it, it comes out from the sides. And I have a nice slide that I didn't give you that shows how it's released. So it's released from the sides in a very steady rate. Okay, so um, I think SDM was the next item, wasn't it? That'd be good, thank you. So SDM, who knows about SDM? Who doesn't know about SDM? There's a whole day next week that I would really don't know about it. Okay, so what I've passed out on SDM is this, is it, is, uh, is, are two documents, and I, and I want to draw your attention to them. One comes from the IRH website, and it's funny the way it prints out with, like, funny IRH website top, you know, when I print it from the website, it, it, it comes out a bit funny, but it, it describes the device, and then I pulled another one off the web on the standard days method, which has wonderful information about it and a lot more teaching materials, but it comes from a natural family planning organization. And I'll tell you what the difference is based on the orientation of who's providing the product. So SDM is a scientific method, despite the fact that some people want to call it a traditional method. Um, and it's uh, the, the uh, 
the data to come up with the days 8 to 19 as the fertile period is based on clinical data that I collected at WHO in 7,415 women in the 70s who used the, uh, who used the Billings method called the cervical mucus method. And we had charts on all those women and the length of their cycle and their days of intercourse and when they got pregnant in the estimated day of pregnancy. The majority of people who use uh, a fertility await awareness-based method have an unintended pregnancy because they don't abstain on fertile days. It isn't because we miscalculated the fertile days. It's a behavior issue. So uh, even though this is was done at Georgetown University, and I'll tell you a funny story about that, and we can let that go on the tape. I don't really care. Uh, uh, Georgetown never had the position that during the fertile days, when the bead gets to the, those days, that you have to abstain. If you want to avoid pregnancy and you're highly motivated to avoid pregnancy, abstain on those days and you won't get pregnant. However, should you like to not abstain on those days, if you use a condom effectively on those days, you will not get pregnant. And the clinical trial that was conducted, published in the journal Contraception, showed actually that the people who abstained on those days had a slightly higher effectiveness rate than the people who reported using condoms on those days because one, condoms aren't always 100% effective and two, condoms aren't always used correctly. So we don't know why that happened, but it is 95% effective when it's used correctly and 88% effective in typical use. Uh, so I said we collected these nine, 7,000, I collected 7,500 cycles that Georgetown was able to get their hands on and they had their scientists and, and those scientists included Virginia Lamp, Ginzy Lamprecht. Does everybody, does anybody know Ginzy? She used to work with us. Um, she's a monitoring evaluation person. She worked at the, worked there with IRIT uh, at the Georgetown Institute and, at the, and they put all those cycles together and they figured out if you were going to, knock out at least 95 to 98% of the pregnancies, what would be the fertile window? And they came up with days 8 to 19. And the difference between the document that Georgetown produces and the wonderful document that was produced by, uh, by whoever that I have from this website is that it says you have to abstain on the fertile days. So that's choice. So the difference between a fertility awareness-based method and natural family planning, they are the same thing. You have some way of determining the fertile period. But in natural family planning, by definition, you abstain on fertile days. And if you don't abstain, you're not practicing natural family planning. And it's much more of a, it's sort of a political issue for them because they don't believe in contraception. Uh, and hence, using something during the fertile period, you're contracepting. And my position has been, you're contracepting if you're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So not too much difference, you know. And in fact, there was an interesting thing written by John Paul II that when you use natural family planning for the wrong reasons, you're sinning. So that's all politics. All right. What was after SDM? Uh, condoms. condoms. Okay, male and female condoms. So on the condoms, you've got, uh, I've taken from our website, because most of you don't, might not know, that we have several really interesting documents that I was responsible for helping to write and edit uh, on the HIV website. Uh, one is co how condoms, condom use, how it relates to HIV and STI prevention. And there's another one on uh, addressing condom supply and demand in PEPFAR. Oh. Somebody's shuffling papers right by the... Okay, and then there's, so we have, the, we have the technical issue brief on OHA website. We have addressing condom supply and demand on the OHA website. And I also had a piece that I did on uh, the effectiveness of condoms in preventing sexually transmitted infections that was handed out. And I also have a piece on the female condom because when we talk about condoms 
and that is the technical brief that's from the OHA website on female condoms. You all should have that too. It says, technical issue brief, female condom safe and effective. That's the second page. I saw somebody holding up the back page. It's four pages. You have it there. Uh, okay, after vasectomy. You still need to use condoms after vasectomy for some people. So uh, <laughs> I think the important thing to know about, I mean, everybody knows about condoms. I mean, it's a widely known method, and, uh, and uh, the big issue is how do you get people to use them, and how do you get them to use them correctly and consistently, and we have some country examples where it works, and, uh, and we know that some uh, sex workers are very, uh, can very effectively um, negotiate condom use. Uh, and you can get condom use up to 90%, but our big problem is in, um, that only about 5% of contraceptive prevalence worldwide for contraception is condoms, and that uh, in, uh, in marriage or with intimate partners is frequently very difficult to negotiate condom use. When used correctly and consistently, condoms are highly effective uh, in preventing unintended pregnancy and HIV and STIs. They are the only dual purpose method we currently have right now, uh, both male and female condoms. And AID provides a whole range of condoms. And if uh, I didn't bring with me this time, but I should have, uh, Simon, maybe you can make sure everybody has. We have a wonderful document on all the products that we provide and what do they cost and how are they packaged. And anybody going to the field I usually have, I thought I had that in my box, but I didn't have it. Anybody going to the field should always take with them uh, that document because it will, let me see if I have it here. It, it, it gives you all the information you need to know uh, about all the products that, um, that, the, that CSL through, the, through our central commodity procurement provides, how they're packaged, what form that they come in, uh, the different brands, uh, and it also gives you if I have it. It also gives you uh, uh, the price list on everything. So I do have my price list. So we provide a whole variety of male and female condoms. Um, and I've got samples of all of them. Uh, and uh, the female condoms that we provide right now is called um, looks. Let me get one out. It's got, actually, there's new packaging. There's now a beautiful purple package. Uh, it's called the FC2. It's made of nitrile, uh, and it's, uh, it comes pre-lubricated. Has every, who, is that, who isn't familiar with female condoms? Who is not familiar with the female condom? Everybody's familiar with it. How many people have tried it if you're willing to fess up? Okay. So it's really an interesting thing to try, by the way, just because I've tried everything I've ever worked on. Uh, and what? What? No. everything that I've ever worked on, I have tried <laughs> other, than, other than long acting methods, because my wife didn't want that. So that's what, that's what the FC2 looks like. Got an inner ring that's used for insertion and an outer ring that it stays out, okay? And it's lubricated. And we also sell it with a sachet of additional lubricant because uh, some people want more lubrication. And uh, they tell me that uh, well-endowed men really demand much more lubrication. Uh, and hence, the, it's provided that way. So that is the female condom we provide. There's another female condom called the woman's condom. How many people have heard of that? So the woman's condom was developed by PATH with USAID funding. Uh, the funding went through Conrad and to PATH. And it's a totally novel approach. This is what it looks like undeployed. 
okay? It's, uh, it's made in China now and sold in China. And uh, the, uh, the clinical trial has been completed of this product and it will get FDA approval probably next year. And it will also be going to WHO pre-qualification. And the interesting thing about this product is that, so it comes with like a little capsule and that's a disposable capsule. Uh, it, not disposable, it dissolves immediately. As soon as you put it, if I were to dip it in water, it would dissolve immediately. As soon as it goes into the vagina, it dissolves immediately. And interestingly enough, I've always said that we could probably put a microbicide into that mm -hmm. also, so it would dissolve with a microbicide, but we don't have an MPT project using that. So when it is deployed, and I don't want to deploy that one, it looks like this. And this is this is old. So, and the way it stays in the vagina, ver which is different than the female, co the, the the FC2. This stays in because it's got an inner ring that sits in almost like a diaphragm. This thing has these uh, hydrophilic pads on the side. So when it opens up in the vagina, they adhere to the moistness of the vaginal epithelium, and they cling to it. They don't cling so tight that you would go ouch when you pull it out, but they cling. And so the negative side of this is it can't come pre-lubricated. Because if you were to pre-lubricate it, those pads wouldn't work. So they are sold with a satchel of, of uh, lubricant. And you need to lubricate the inside before you use it. What's in the capsule, Jeff? Oh, the entire condom. So if I were to fold that up, it would look like that. Oh, okay. So inside the condom are all those hydro, uh, hydrophilic pads <coughs> and the full length of it. But it's, it's done this way so it's easy to insert because you have this little, it's almost like a pessary you would insert. And you just push it right in and so it's very easy to insert. And in the acceptability trials um, of this product, much to my surprise, I'm happy to admit, it was much preferred over that and the ready latex condom. People liked it better. But I would think that the, the, the whole lubrication factor, like having to separate, like that would be like an impediment. I would do that. Hmm. So you then choose this one. So more choice, you know. So it's, but this is sold with lubricant. Yeah. But it's just separate. You'd have to add the lubricant. But a lot of people add additional lubricant to this. Mm -hmm. So those are male and female condoms. Uh, I think female condoms are totally underutilized. I think they are a really good option. And in the um, advertising material for the female condom, it says you've got to use it three times before you make a decision. Don't make a decision based on one use. Mm -hmm. The original one was made of polyurethane, and people complained it made noise. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's made of this, nitro this uh, uh, um, synthetic latex. And it really is, the best practice is use it a few times, get used to it, uh, and, and, and then you will more appreciate it. It is a bit strange, you know, and it's you know, nice to use it with the lights out, I think. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the other thing on male condoms, I should say, is that uh, I spent an awful lot of time years ago working with manufacturers to make better male condoms. Ones that, you know, I had this pipe dream that if you could make a male condom that was so acceptable that it made sex better with it than without it, then it would not be difficult to get men to use it. But the regular condom, the tight-fitting condom, is that many times people have called taking a shower with a raincoat on, and men complain about the lack of sensation that is caused by the use of of condoms, and we discovered from research that uh, looser fitting condoms were much more acceptable than the, the tighter fitting condoms. And Dr. Reddy made a whole range of condoms that looked like Dairy Queen cones, and there was a lot more material, and it was more of accordion style that would ride the penis that would that was claimed to cause uh, much more pleasure. And but we were always unable to demonstrate that there was an unambiguous preference for that product. The Gates Foundation has 10 grants out 
uh, right now, grand challenges on condoms. And three, of, I've reviewed all of those, and three of them look very promising to me. And I was interviewed uh, for, I forget what, magazine uh, on my views on condoms. And, and Gates told them to get in touch with me because I had tried to do what they're trying to do right now. And uh, interestingly, I was totally misquoted uh, in the article because I have, I, I have some faith that a couple of their projects might lead to better materials. But I'm very skeptical about our inability to determine preference. Because what happens in the, most of the studies is you give a man uh, or a couple three different condoms uh, that are very different. And then you got A, B, and C. And you randomly allocate who starts with A, who starts with B, who starts with C. And then after they're done with two weeks of using that one, they go to B, and then, or they go to C, or they go to C, then they go to A, and then they go to B. So after about a month or six weeks, you've tried them all, and you recruit people who will have at least two acts of intercourse a week, so that they use one for two weeks, and then one for two weeks, another one for two weeks, and then the third one for two weeks. And after each act, they fill out a form, and then after the, using all th three acts with one of them, they fill out a form. And when you're all done, they fill out another form. And, and then we try to figure out preferences. And then, then there's like the gestalt, and people say, well, I like condom A, but then when you say, which one are you going to recommend? They recommend condom B. It's very confusing, and I've come to the conclusion that that uh, our weakest link is our ability to measure um, acceptability. And one reason for that is that, um, speaking from my own experience, and I'm sure everybody else's experience, is that not every act of intercourse is the same. It's not this mechanical thing. <laughs> they did make mechanical machines, by the way, to test condom strength. But not every act is the same, and you carry different baggage, and, and you know, and like George Costanza said, makeup sex is the best sex. <laughs> so if you're, tr if you're doing condom number three with makeup sex, maybe you really liked it a lot. So we don't have the, we don't have the capacity to, to do a good job of measuring effectiveness. So one of the things that we've done in FHI has been a leader in this, is that we do these like market search we, surveys where you go to a market area and you have all condoms and you offer the condoms to people. Take anyone you want. Take them all. Try them. Come back. And then after they've used them, they come back and say, which one do they prefer? And in the trials that we've done, uh, after the trial was over, we then say to the people in the trial, okay, we're going to give you a hundred of the one you want. Which one do you want? And we try to, try to get an idea of effectiveness, but we've never been able to find any condom that 90% of people said, this is the, I really like this product. So we, we were stuck. And I, and I said that to the uh, interviewer, that I was skeptical that we're going to be able to determine that some of these materials are so much better than other materials that they, that they would be a, a better seller. And, and I was misquoted on that. that I, huh? I can't remember which one. I'm the one who emailed you. <laughs> it was the, <laughs> one I did, oh I did the New Yorker. I did one on the New Yorker, which was, which was a... Uh, which I got a lot of heat for. Was that the one you sent out? I don't know, maybe, I don't know, no. One of them said, it said something to him, the skeptic, something. Yeah, like, <laughs> that was The Economist, I think. The Economist. Yeah. And I wasn't a skeptic, but I did one for the, I think it was The New Yorker, I'm not sure. And I said that uh, years ago when I was trying to develop a condom that made sex better, uh, Duff Gillespie was the head of the office then, and he said, look, Jeff, he said, I don't want Congress to come beating down on us that we're trying to make sex good. <laughs> and I said, are you kidding? I said, every congressman would be thanking us. <laughs> All right, so the next, so we're done with condoms, male and female condoms. So uh, before we end, uh, I want to talk about, did, what do I have next on that permanent. list? Permanent. Oh, permanent. Okay, let's do permanent. So what we don't have for you is, I do not have for you a female sterilization document, but I have Sisyphus, right? Vasectomy. Mm -hmm. So, did you, do you all have that? Yeah. It's a presentation I made at an Engender Health meeting, and I was given that as the title. <laughs> and the title, well, you remember Sisyphus, you know, you push the rock up the hill, and you just caught it, never get it. He never got it up the hill. 
<laughs> and it was, that was the uh, analogy to vasectomy. We just can't seem to get too much traction uh, with vasectomy. And vasectomy is a marvelous uh, permanent method. It's uh, much preferred uh, in terms of ease of performance than female sterilization. Yet it isn't the male who gets pregnant. So some women are not sure that the man has really had a vasectomy, so we have that issue. And also vasectomy is not 100% effective. And I've written a thing on the gender aspects of vasectomy because if a man is vasectomized and his wife gets pregnant, she could possibly suffer from domestic or, Has left the or, um, uh, or you know, intimate partner violence because I've had a vasectomy and you must be sleeping with somebody else. So you can't ever say it's 100% effective because there can be reanastomosis, which means that the, the, that the cut uh, vas deferens reunites, or very, more commonly, men don't necessarily wait the uh, 12 weeks it takes before it works. And if you have sex before that period of time, you could still be um, uh, fertile. It's a marvelous postpartum method for limiters because there's usually postpartum abstinence for the same period of time that it takes for the vasectomy to work. So in, one, in the piece that Trish McDonald did on uh, postpartum family planning, the, it was once called the call to action, but it changed its name. We weren't allowed, I forget what it's called. There's a document, I think we're providing it to everybody, on postpartum family planning. And in that we talk about uh, the vasectomy as a good postpartum method for limiters, for just for that reason. Uh, and it's easy to perform. It's, there's a no scalpel technique, which they keep saying the new no scalpel technique. Well, the no, that new method is about 30 years old now, uh, so it isn't new, but, and it isn't non-surgical, although it, you, one thinks it is. So rather than using a scalpel, we have a, we have a sharpened hemostat that is used to puncture the scrotum so that you can have access to the vas deferens. So they, they say non-surgical, but it, 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 it isn't really non-surgical. However, it is much less, much less uh, uh, pain and much less hematoma and less side effects than the standard scalpel vasectomy that was done. And in, uh, for tubal ligation, which we don't have a piece on it yet, and we're going to produce one, aren't we, Kara? Uh, the uh, interesting thing about tubal ligation, when I first started working in the field, everything, and this was in the 70s, we were out there with laparoscopic sterilization. And companies like Carl Stortz, which is a German company that makes this equipment, made a fortune because everybody was using no scalpel, uh, sorry, was using, uh, uh, was using uh, these, these um, laparoscopic techniques. So you had to have a laparoscope. And we quickly learned that we couldn't keep them working and they were expensive and you needed a high level of training and the spare parts it, were hard to get and if they weren't working there weren't any sterilizations and when I was at WHO we did a comparative trial between nurse midwives doing a mini lap and doctors doing laparoscopic sterilization and, and the nurse midwives won out. It's so much easier, so fast, so easy to do and so mini lap is the most popular technique for tubal ligation right now. Uh, relatively easy to perform. Uh, only requires local anesthetic. And it's a uh, you know, highly effective method. And it's the most popular method, as I told you, in the United States and several other countries. Sterilization is the number one method. More women are sterilized in the world than use any other method. Um, and, uh, and in many countries, vasectomy rates are higher than female sterilization rates. Jumping back one second, I forgot to mention to you that on the IUD, I want to jump back one second, I forgot to mention PPIUD, postpartum IUD. So if you do an immediate postpartum insertion, it used to be that you needed a special kind of a long forceps so that you could, you, you, you use a speculum and you then would insert this thing deep to get to the fundus, immediate postpartum. So you, to, you needed an instrument. 
And uh, our friend, uh, Paul Blumenthal, said, gosh, we don't need an instrument. We just need a longer inserter. So he had Pregna make a PPIUD inserter. And I brought it with me. So you can compare the length of these two inserters. So here's an interval inserter, and here's the PPIUD inserter. So all you need is a longer inserter, and then you can just use an inserter. You don't need any instruments. So Pregna now makes for us, and are we, I don't know if we're buying them. Uh, yeah, we are hoping to. Yeah. And we've had a couple of presentations, and Paul's coming, isn't he? Yeah. When? In two weeks. Okay, so there's going to be a presentation on PPIUD. So if you want to see that. So I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. I apologize. Is the still like two weeks postpartum? No. You can do immediate. You can do immediate. Uh, you can do before, within 48 hours, or then you wait four weeks. That's the recommendation right now. But we like to see immediate. Post-placental insertion of the, you know. So, but of course you've got to do counseling before childbirth. You don't do it on the table. Uh, and you've got to make sure that the woman has been well informed and has decided to select this method. And if you haven't done that, then you wait. There is a slightly higher risk, but if it's done well, it's minimized. And again, we don't worry about expulsion as long as the woman is know, knows that she's supposed to look and make sure it hasn't been expelled. Okay, so we've done sterilization. What, is, what, is, what makes mini left mini? The incision. <laughs> so it's right above the pubic hair, below the belly, and it's a very small incision. That's why it's mini. It's not like a Mini Cooper. It's about that wide. That's pretty small. Rather than the way they used to do it years well, yeah, ago. It, would it, it would open you up completely. Oh, okay. the, I mean, we, it was a surgical method. It was, it was a laparotomy. It was what's called laparotomy. You know, so it was an open, your, you, you open, much bigger incision. Depends on what you, well, on vasectomy, yeah. let's go to vasectomy for a minute. Uh, in the United States, so we did a study. I, I was, when I was in charge of FHI, I was very involved with FHI and in gender health, which was AVSC at the time, doing the first study. We had very poor guidance on how long do you wait after a vasectomy to be infertile. And the guidance was all over the map. Uh, after uh, 16 weeks, after 20 ejaculations, we didn't have good data. So we organized the studies to demonstrate what was the data, and it turned out to be 12 weeks. So it doesn't have nothing to do with the number of ejaculates. 12 weeks after the procedure, you're infertile. Okay? And the reason that it doesn't work is that what do you do when you expose the vas deferens? So when a man has a vasectomy, you have to get to the vas deferens. Those are the tubes that carry the sperm. Okay? So what do you do with them? So some people used to cut them and tie both ends. Some people used to just cut them and tie not the end that's closest to the testes, but the other end. Because if you tie the end that's closest to the testes, there's something called blowout. There's a lot of pressure that's built up. And then when that escapes, it could possibly cause a reanastomosis. So they only tied the other end. Some people cut out two centimeters, like an inch. Two and a half centimeters is an inch. Some people cut out longer distances. Some people were worried about cutting out too much because if you ever had, there was any regret and you were going to try to reconnect them, if you cut out too much, you could never do that. Um, some people take the fascia, so that little bit of tissue that's around uh, the vas deferens and around many of your organs, uh, and they would wrap it up and fold it around it. So they'd close it and then tie it. That's interfascial position, that's called. And then we did a study and we showed that if you cauterize it, cauterize both ends, that's like the most effective way, but then you need a cautery. And, and uh, FHI was involved with PATH in making a handheld thermal cautery device. Uh, so in the United States, because of litigation, and people who do vasectomy do everything. <laughs> they cut it. 
They take the fascia and they wrap it around and then they, 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 they cauterize it and then they tie it. They want to do everything in their power to minimize the likelihood that some man's going to come back and sue you because I've had a vasectomy. Have they made like a, like a, a experiment with like a reversible vasectomy? Well, where they just like, you know, we've tried. We've, I feel like that would be like a... Yeah. Like a, a lot of money yeah, has been so spent. Everybody gets vasectomized. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've spent a lot of money on research on looking at uh, reversible vasectomy. Yeah. Hmm. It's very hard to do. Those sperm in that organ, the vas deferens as, as well as the, uh, the fallopian tubes, they're an organ. They're muscle, they contract, they restrict, and the body is made for that sperm to get through that vas deferens and cause pregnancy. I mean, that's how we're constructed. And the, and the fallopian tubes are made to carry that egg from the ostium after, after the egg is released from the ovary through the tubes and get it into the uterus. Of course, fertilization occurs in the tubes. It doesn't occur in the uterus. So, the, so in the man, when we try to do all these different techniques, nature was fighting us. In fact, we had a thing called the shug. It was a combination of a plug and a shunt that was put into the vas deferens. And we actually had two units put in because one didn't work to try to make sure the sperm couldn't get around it. But the sperm get around it. And if you made it big enough to block the sperm, it usually ruptured the vas deferens. A very difficult task to make a reversible method. And of course, the simplest idea was, wouldn't it be nice if you had a little stopcock, no pun intended, and you put that into vas deferens, and you could just like reach in and just turn it on and open it and close it. Not happened, but one of our priorities is, is highly effective non-surgical sterilization because I believe that many more people would accept sterilization if it wasn't a surgical procedure. They just don't want a surgical procedure. So we have a big non-surgical uh, sterilization mandate. And in fact, uh, there's an APS that will go out for research soon from RTU. And amongst the technologies that we're asking people to submit applications for will be uh, non-surgical uh, sterilization. Okay, so moving right along, I want to mention a couple of other things. There's nothing, now I have some new methods on there, right? Rings, so, pardon? It says rings, then bears. Right, so vaginal rings. Who knows about vaginal rings? What's marketed right now? Nuva ring. And do we know what it contains? Nuva bling. Nuva bling. What is it? Nuva bling. Uh, wasn't that, that, that was Tabitha's. So I don't, I don't have a Nuva ring with you, but I got their advertisement. Oh, my God. <laughs> the conference. That's so, so this is Nuva ring. It, it's about that size, but it's not that color. Uh, and it releases a tenogestrel, uh, which is the same drug in Implanon, plus ethanol estradiol. Okay? And uh, it only lasts a month. Okay? So you need to replace it every month. And... Uh, it, we don't have a public sector price on it. It is not widely available. In, you can't, it's hardly find it in a developing world. Maybe some private sector places you can find it. And it's a very popular method in the United States. Lots of women like it. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it, vaginal rings, they, they release drug in a steady state. Uh, and, and lots of people say that it doesn't interfere with intercourse. In fact, some people say it makes intercourse more pleasurable because it sort of floats and it touches spots that are, cause pleasure. Uh, so uh, that's the only ring that's available right now. The POP Council uh, has two rings, but I'm only going to talk about, one of them is progesterone only, and it's for lacta lactating women. It releases the natural hormone progesterone, progering it's called. But the more important one that I'm most interested in is called the CVR, contraceptive vaginal ring. It looks like this, and I'll pass it around so people can feel it. And there are two implants that are put into that. One releases the progestin nesterone, which is a novel progestin with some very special benefits. And the other uh, implant that goes into that ring releases ethyl estradiol and nesterone. The ring lasts for one year, and you wear it for three weeks, and then you take it out for one week, just like a cycle of pills. 
In the week that you take it out, you have a breakthrough bleeding. And then you put it back in and you wear it for three more weeks and then you take it out for a week. And it lasts for a year. So one ring gives you a year of contraception and people say, do you have to take it out? And the answer is absolutely not. You could leave it in all the time. But the POP Council doesn't have the data to support that claim. But we know with oral contraceptives, for many women, they never went to the placebo. They went from active to active to active because they didn't want to menstruate. And then in the United States and other countries, they sold seasonal, which is an 84-day pill. And now in the United States, they have a pill called Librel, which you take every day for 365 days. You never have a, pre, a pill free interval. Well, this ring was made to mimic the menstrual cycle that you wear it in three weeks in, one week out, lasts for a year. So it's, it will be the only long acting female controlled hormonal method. So once a woman has that, if she likes it, she continues to use it. If she doesn't like it, she doesn't have to visit any healthcare provider to never put it back in. So. We, we, we have great hope for that. Uh, the pivotal clinical trials have been completed for FDA approval. And then the FDA required some additional studies because the progestin is a new chemical. So Pop Council is just completing those studies right now. And hopefully... So progestin and estrogen? Or? Estrogen and progestin. And so that's also like immediate return to fertility? Yeah, absolutely. You take it out. In fact, it returns to fertility so quickly that if you don't wear it properly, you'll get pregnant. So if you take it out of your body too much, you're allowed to take it out of your body for two hours a day and not affect your hormone levels. But if you take it out for longer than that, it will. And in fact, in the clinical trials that were done, they had interviewing women and they used a CASI, this, this automatic, uh, this assisted um, uh, computerized interviewing technique that's used. And they found with the CASI, where people are much more likely to tell you the truth if they're not talking to the provider, that in almost all the pregnancies, when they interviewed women who got pregnant, they admitted having and taking it out and leaving it out longer periods of time. Why? Do they feel it? They just, no, they just, they just didn't put it back in in time. They just, why and, they take it out? Like why well, you might want to take it out to wash it. You might, when you defecate, depending on, who you are and what your facilities are. We're very wary. Most of the expulsions occur, there's not a lot of expulsions, but most of them occur when you're in a squatting position. Mm -hmm. And if you defecate over a uh, latrine, mm -hmm. you, if that goes down the latrine, you're in trouble. So one idea is take it out before that. So then you got to put it back in. And so I had a... So, you know, there's, but you don't have to take it out. You never have to take it out. And some people like the way it feels, and you can feel it. And that's a, there's a lot more soft uh, uh, silicon in there, and people, you know, people say that they like it. And so it had a high acceptability. Partners found it acceptable. And uh, we're hoping by, uh, it would be launched in 2016. The biggest problem is it's very expensive. And the Gates Foundation is giving money uh, to the POP Council to make a cheaper version because we would never be able to buy that ring. It ended up being too expensive. So, interesting form of contraception, um, liked by lots of people. So the other thing I wanted to show you uh, was the Silk's diaphragm. Who's heard of that? What's it marketed as? One size fits you. Yeah, and what's the name of it? Go ahead. Kaya. C A Y A. Has anybody seen the advertising on Kaya? Wonder how they came up with that name. Maybe the same reason. So, <clears throat> this is really unique in many respects, and the way it was developed is very unique. So, we gave money to Path, uh, who came, who, they're great on design, to come up with a better diaphragm. So, what they did is they took diaphragm users and women who were nurses who were help fitting diaphragms and they got them in groups and they sort of followed a uh, ICPD approach, a woman-centered approach. Get women to design what they want. 
And they gave them an all-flex ortho diaphragm. I mean, people have heard about that, the standard diaphragm. Guess what? Prescription only. Boy, that's a real abused product, isn't it? So if you're a diaphragm user and you know your size, I'm a 75 millimeter diaphragm user. My husband and I have gone away for the weekend and I forgot my diaphragm. You go to a pharmacy and say, look, I need an ortho all flex 75 millimeter diaphragm. Where's your prescription? How foolish is that? Well, nevertheless, this is one size fits all, so there's no fitting. So through the pro an iterative process of women saying what they liked, what they didn't like, and the engineers making changes, and they went through this process for a long period of time. They also made the woman's female column a similar way, but this was the first of those iterative processes. They came up with this design, and this one-size-fits-all diaphragm-like device has some very unique properties. One, it doesn't look like a standard diaphragm, which is a big, round, medical-looking, latex-type device, even of those made of silicon. This is lilac, so it's a little bit more attractive. It's also much more ergometric, and um, it has little dimples on the sides so they can't slip out of your hands. So there was an episode of Seinfeld when <laughs> Elaine's diaphragm popped out of her hand. <laughs> Where'd my diaphragm go? It's also sponge-worthy. That was another good episode. So, but the diaphragm flipped out of her hand, and she couldn't even find it. So meanwhile, this thing's got little dimples so that it can't slip out of your hand. Secondly, when you squeeze those dimples, it inverts. So it makes it much easier uh, for insertion, which is like that. Okay? There is an arrow that tells you which way it goes in. So there's an arrow on the top that will tell you that it goes that way. And it has a little dimple on the bottom, so when you remove it, it's very easy. You don't have to get your hand around the ring. You can just put your hand in that little dimple. So it's one size fits most, not all. Women with a heavily inverted uterus would have a hard time fitting it. Uh, parity doesn't matter, uh, which is very interesting. And it can be provided with a lubricant. So it can be sold with a spermicide. And uh, Conrad is studying it with, uh, with, a, uh, with acid form, right? Tenofovir. Tenofovir and acid form too? Who's doing it with acid form? Tenofovir. Yeah, so if you wanted to make a dual purpose method out of this, mm -hmm. what you could do is add a antiretroviral like tenofovir for which we have data on HIV prevention. Mm -hmm. And you could also add a, you could make the tenofovir spermicidal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you would have increased the the contraceptive effect in this, but with a spermicide that was also an anti-HIV. There's also a, another spermicide called um, acid form, amphora, which, um, which Women Care Global is working on. And that could be added to this product to make it more effective. So uh, it's, it's a nice product. It's been approved by the FDA. It's being sold. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice product. Another product that we worked on, and I always love to use this one for the sniff test. Does anybody know what the sniff test is? The sniff test is you look at something and you go, ooh, I don't like it. And, and, and lots of things never pass the sniff test. Here's a product that never passes the sniff test. Could you imagine that using that product as a, as a cap? It looks big and bulky and, and strange. And this was called Leah Shield. We helped to develop this. It's available on the internet only. And it's uh, also uh, a one size fits most. And people would say, oh gosh, I would never put that inside myself. Look how bulky and hard it is. And when we did the clinical trial, women didn't complain at all. And men didn't complain at all. They did not find it uncomfortable. But it looks like something that you would not want to be putting inside yourself. And hence, I have that little picture. Does anybody have that picture that I have? What is that? You want me to do? <laughs> but, so I usually, before I show these devices, I always show that slide. Because, you know, who would want to do that? And another one that we worked on, it's also available for sale, is called FemCap. 
And FemCap comes in three sizes depending on parity. And again, it's a, it's a combination of a, it's like a cervical cap with a thing that pulls it out. And we're not providing them. And, and, uh, and the inventor was a mom and pop operation. And they did a clinical trial with a device that did not have this on it. Had left the conference. And then they decided they needed to add that later, but it's not been approved by the FDA this way. It was approved without it. So it's another barrier method that we worked on. So the last thing that I will mention to you, uh, and then we can talk about other things if you like, is uh, this multipurpose prevention technologies, which I alluded to when, I sh when we showed you uh, the, uh, the Silk's diaphragm. So uh, a, a big initiative in the research division uh, and other programs uh, is to come up with technologies that, that provide protection against unintended pregnancy and other health benefits like prevention of HIV. The, so the three big priorities are contraception and HIV, contraception and HSV, herpes simplex virus, which is a major cofactor for HIV acquisition, and uh, contraception and HPV, human papillomavirus. I don't know how many of you know that the cause of cervical cancer is oncogenic types of the human papillomavirus. And if you don't have an oncogenic type of the human papillomavirus, you're not going to get cervical cancer. There is a little chance that there could be some other antecedent. And Jim Shelton wrote a paper on <coughs> parity and cervical cancer. And he tried to control for HPV, and in very high parity women, there's cervical cancer. And they think it has to do with damage to the cervix. But I'm not 100% convinced it isn't also a type of HPV that has not yet been identified. But there are, there are oncogenic types, cancer-causing HPV, and if we could prevent those, you would prevent almost certainly 99% of of uh, cervical cancer. So we have this uh, program ongoing right now, and there are several products that are in the pipeline. Uh, one of them is a vaginal ring uh, that would contain levonorgestrel and uh, tenofovir. And another one is a vaginal ring that contains the NNRTI depivirine, which is in clinical trial right now for HIV prevention, and levonorgestrel. And then the POP Council has a ring also that's going to have MIV-150 in NRTI and zinc. OK. So we have, we have, so there's some real good leads that are being pursued right now that might afford us the opportunity of having highly effective contraception and HIV prevention at the same time. The big problem on the HIV prevention is when you use an ARV-based uh, prevention technology, it can't be over the counter quite yet because you would not want to put that in somebody who already has HIV. Oh, okay. Because okay. you don't want to cause resistance, although Dr. Doncell thinks there's a very low incidence of resistance with tenofovir. A, 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 it would be a good practice that you would not give ARVs for, for prevention to people who are already HIV infected, who might need to go on therapy. And we have a lot of good data right now on, uh, on ARVs for prevention. I'm sure you've read those, the PrEP study. There's a whole bunch of studies that we came out. The big issue is who could afford ARVs? And, and if you don't have a limited amount of ARVs, you certainly want to use it for treatment. So, but ARVs for prevention are highly effective, and we're looking at the combination of contraception and ARVs for HIV prevention. And the nice thing about tenofovir from the study that we did, the Caprisa 004 trial that showed its effectiveness in preventing acquisition of HIV in uh, high-risk women was it cut the risk of HSV in half. So it's effective against HSV also. So that's the story. And if you have any questions, I mean, we're finished before 4. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any remarks, any technologies you think we need?
certain, not taking certain methods or wondering which methods will affect their sex drive. Did, did the R materials talk about that? Or no. No, we don't talk about that. And it's very, you know, there's not a lot of good data on the effect of libido. There's a lot more data on the effect of libido after pregnancy. Uh, we don't have a lot of data on libido. I know that, uh, that uh, some of the steroids that are used in contraception, like levonorgestrel, has some androgenicity. And that is good for libido for women. For men. So, you know, for sex offenders got that but I don't know if you know this or not. So the standard treatment for a sex offender in the United States years ago was to give them Depo Provera. You give Depo Provera to a man, his libido is shot. Completely shot. And sex offenders were given Depo Provera. And they still sometimes use it. And men will do that voluntarily. Like every three months for the rest of yeah. their life. <laughs> well, as long as you want to cut their libido, they'll have no libido at all. So, um, Pardon? No. Even as old men, they could be dangerous, so you're going to want to do it until they... <laughs> well, well, not everybody's a sexual abuser, I guess. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but for, for Depo, there is a, that, that, that's that been... Or, it's you know, it's or, noted as one of the issues, but it's very uncommon. The, um, you should all be getting the document, uh, Contraceptive Questions and Answers. Yes, I said that the other... Contraceptive day. Technology Questions and Answers. It's written by... I wrote it with with Mia Foreman at PRB, and it goes through every single method, and it has the most common rumors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what's the truth. And it's a nicely, if I don't mind saying so myself, it's very authoritative because I didn't do it alone. <laughs> I was the primary author, Mia was the primary editor, and she did a lot of the research to get the, she helped me because she pulled up all the most recent uh, evidence so we have a good reference library but I went to other experts for instance I went to Chelsea to help me with the chapter with the section on HIV uh, acquisition and progestins so she did that I had somebody else I had um, Ann Burke from Hopkins who I worked very closely with pull up the most recent data on cancer so uh, it, it's you know, there's this issue about depo and uh, and uh, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I have a I address that very carefully in that book. So I've used I rely on other sources to help uh, me with with writing the best possible response we could write. So I think it's a, a very useful, and I've given it in uh, journalist trainings that I've been involved in with, with, with PRB and in um, in uh, I did it in in. Um, in Addis at the International, you there? No. Did you go to Addis? Well, at the uh, International Conference on Family Planning that we had in Addis, Monica was there. You were there. You helped with it. The, uh, we did a journalist training, and I handed it out to all these journalists. Uh, you know, we, we had a question and answer with them, and, uh, and I went to each one of them. I gave it to them. I said, look, when you do a story on contraception, you know, you, you hear all these rumors, and you, and you want to write about it, but I do... Do us a favor. When, you, when somebody tells you something negative, go into this little document and look at it before you, before you write your paper and make sure that you're not, you're not fostering a myth. Okay, well, thank you all. Oh, no, they're all gone. They all disappeared ages ago. Uh, this is Anne, and uh, can I, can I, uh, okay? Can yeah, I ask yes. sure. Ah, uh, um, so going following on this whole idea of rumors and, and uh, provider bias, Jeff, do you have any suggestions for kind of how to combat at the country level? How what we can do to combat provider bias, um, particularly for methods, long-acting permanent methods for youth? And I know that, you know, in the Philippines, we, we had kind of thought about this contraceptive road show and working through OBGYN societies, yeah. and, uh, nurse midwifery uh, associations. But do you have any kind of suggestions for interventions that we can do to uh, 
you know, get so get, combat some of these misconceptions. I know that also in the, in the Philippines, the thing was Thank if you. you had if your shoes were tied, you turned into a sex maniac. Oh. you know, <laughs> it was the opposite of a reduced libido. But you know, so well, you know, any uh, suggestions uh, on combating water uh, bias and misconceptions. Well, on that last one, I want to tell you something. There's a little bit of truth in it. You don't become a sex maniac, but the fact is when people don't fear unintended pregnancy, they report more satisfaction in sex because the, for many women, the fear of having an unintended pregnancy really impacts on sexual satisfaction. So when they're given highly effective contraception, they, particularly sterilization, they, men, both men and women report better sex lives because they're not worried about having a pregnancy. But I think you've, you've answered some of them, right. professional societies, but I think it's training. I think it's provider training, and I think it's, you know, and, and working with journalists at the country level to, 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 to get out the wow. truth. Uh, it's very hard to overcome uh, these issues. And IUDs is a perfect example. I, you know, I was invited to Malawi years ago after FHI completed their trials on HIV and IUDs. And the mission staff then were jo Joan LaRosa and, uh, I forget the other one's name, Andrews, Linda Andrews. They were both there and they said, look, will you speak to all the, we're going to organize something with the Ministry of Health and we're going to bring in all the doctors in the long way. We, can you do a seminar and in, go over contraceptive technology and include IUDs? We really want to increase IUD use. So present the data. So I got all the late, late breaking data on IUDs and I focused my presentation on all methods, but I focused on the IUD and popped the myth on HIV and STIs and, and causing infertility. And I provided all the data yeah. to all these doctors, and when they were all done, they said, tell us, tell us about implants. <laughs> they couldn't care less. They'd already had their minds made up. They didn't want IUDs, and my evidence wasn't going to do anything to change their views. They just had a bias against IUDs. So I think, you know, yeah. getting good news, go, if you, you know, in the country, work with journalists who are, are, are reporting. You know, uh, PRB's done all these journalist trainings, so we have the names of journalists in countries. Uh, FHI's done journalist training. Okay. And we've got to work with the journalists who are writing in the papers that are being read. There's a very popular magazine in Latin America called Para Ti, uh, uh, for, for you. And uh, it's read throughout. And I was, years ago, I was involved with them to get articles in Parati about contraception because all the Latin American women, you've probably read it, no? Do you know? Yeah. So they were all read this thing. So let's get good articles there because they're not reading medical journals. They're, not, they're reading these local magazines. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you.